Ready. Ready when you are. Cool. Well, let's do it then. Well, welcome to the show, Aaron Brandfast. Appreciate yeah. you uh, reaching out first. And, and I want to recommend to other people like you did to reach out if you want to be on the podcast because I have all kinds of people that are like, hey, I know a guy. Or I know this person. I'm like, I don't know these people. Feel free yeah. to reach out to me, though. You know, uh, I have the link in my w- website and um, the link in the show description and all that stuff for people to fill out the form. So uh, it took us a little bit and we worked all the logistics out, but we finally finally got this to work out. So thanks for yeah, coming on, cool. man. Yeah, happy to do it. Yeah, so you joined the military. So you did 20 years. Um, yeah. uh, just over. I said you had broken time, so actually being 21 years. So you're you're yep. one of the people that were pre-9-11, and you got that experience. And then, yeah. you know, a full career. How much did the military change, you know, in that pre-9-11, like what you remember as a boot, compared to like what a boot in 2000, like 20 is coming into, you know what I'm saying? I, you know, I guess I think that every, every, oh, I, you know, I know every Marine always is, you know, has this perspective that things have completely changed since the time they were a boot, you know, and it's a, a totally different Marine Corps and all that stuff. But I don't really know. I think that um, if I take it in chunks, right, like that first six years I did, so like 93 to 99, like pretty much just peacetime Marine stuff, right? And then coming back in 2001, um, it, it was it was pretty much the same. Like I, I no discernible change except that you know when I when I got out the first time, um, you know t- the two things that were going to get you assassinated by somebody in garrison was wearing a rigger's belt or wearing a boonie hat, right? And then when I came back in, both those things had become like mandatory, right? So little little changes like that, but. Um, <sighs> It's hard to gauge, you know, I'm still around the military as a contractor. I work at MARSOC, you know, as a civilian and I'm still deploying. Um, so I'm still out there where these guys are at. And to be honest, from my perspective, it doesn't seem drastically different to me. I think I, I think the organization is definitely changing. The DOD has got a lot of um, changes, especially in the last, you know, uh, eight to 12 months. But the people... Um, the people that I interact with, they they seem to me to be the same um, like type of person that I've been interacting with my my whole you know life as a military person. Yeah, for sure. No, that makes sense. It's uh, it's a it's a different kind of like attitude to join the military. One, and then two to like join the Marine Corps because when you go to the recruiter's office, everyone knows. You know, you're looking at all the offices. Everyone knows the Marine Corps is like basic is the hardest, and a lot of people that right there just knowing that separates people over to like the army and stuff. So you have a different mentality of, of person that actually joins the Marine Corps itself. Uh, I'll say, I I know one thing that's definitely different is uh, young people now that are considering joining the military, they know everything about everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's the guys that'll be like, they know I want to be a, you know, I want to be a, uh, you know, a Marine recon guy. And this is exactly the path to it. And they've seen 600 YouTube videos about it. They know how to work out in preparation for it. You know, like they they can reach out to military people online and like ask direct questions. Whereas, you know, back I'm sure when you joined and it was definitely the same with me. I had no no idea what was going. On. I'd seen Full Metal Jacket. Uh, you know, um, I there basically was, knew what <laughs> knew what the Marines were, and that's about it. You know, there was a handful of like uh, boot camp documentaries going around, and like one or two like boot camp books you know, that yeah. were out there, but it was mostly like, oh shit, let's see what happens. And a lot of people thought that like full metal jacket would be, you know, that would be like their boot camp experience, yeah, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. you know, to a little bit it is, I guess, to the, some of it, but a lot of it's kind of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. But so when you came in, you were a machine gunner, man. How was that? How was the, uh, you came in after the Gulf War and right now people are coming in after we're leaving Afghanistan. And a lot of people yeah. in my latter years before I got out were Super bummed they weren't going to get a rotation in Afghanistan and stuff like that. And I don't know if guys are giving them shit about never deploying or whatever. I'm sure they are in the fleet. It is what it is. Did you guys receive kind of crap from the people that went to, like, the Gulf War and did all that stuff? Yeah, because <clears throat> when I checked in, by the time I got to the fleet, you know, it was, like, uh, late 1993, early 94. So, I mean, I'm in a platoon with Lance Corporals that had been in, like, Task Force Ripper in Gulf War One. you know? Mm-hmm. They were, like, you know, some dragon gunners and stuff that, through no fault of their own, their MOS was frozen and they couldn't pick up or whatever. Guys that were on the, that were on the, ta- the tail end of their four years in the Marines that had been, you know, on a, on a 
you know, real combat deployment stuff. And so that, that was a little brutal, but it didn't, I wasn't in very long before most of those guys were gone, you know, like a handful of those guys were still around on my first deployment. And then before too long, those dudes were all, all long gone, except for like staff NCOs and that kind of thing. But I don't remember catching too much. I mean, uh, checking into three, one as a boot, like it, they were just every, it was kind of brutal anyway. So it didn't matter to me why they were being dicks. It was like, they could be dicks about the fact that they'd been in combat and I hadn't, or just, just any other myriad reason why, you know, to, to kind of abuse the new guys, but to let you know that you're still the new guy. Yeah. You're the boot man. Yeah. You're waiting for that next boot drop to come in. So you don't feel so That's bad. It. Anymore. <laughs> That's it. The next group of guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, when you, when you were there, when you came in as a machine gunner, what, what machine gun were you guys using at the time? Were you guys using two forties? Yeah. Was that a, no, no, uh, M 60 echo three. So, okay. Dude, as far as I was concerned, I was fucking animal mother. You know what I mean? Except yeah. that I was like five six and I weighed about 150 pounds back then. But in my mind, so I didn't know anything about. Uh, I didn't know much about the Marine Corps. I knew, you know, I, I I joined the infantry on purpose, but I I thought the infantry was just one thing. I didn't know that there was separate jobs in the in the infantry or any of that shit. So mm-hmm. when I was in um, MCT, they used to make grunts go to MCT and SOI. They don't do that anymore because it's fucking redundant, right? But back then yeah. you had to go to both. So it was at MCT um, at the end of it when the open contract guys found out what their MOSs were going to be. That's when we found out what specific uh, uh, infantry MOS we were getting. So when I found out I was going to be a machine gunner, I, to me it was like a big bonus. I was like in my simple – and I was 17, by the way. So I joined – I was barely 17 when I – joined i turned 18 in infantry school so i was real young and when i found out i was gonna be a machine gunner in my mind i thought like i I'd, I'd already like elevated a notch you know i'm like oh now i'm i'm uh, like a, a super grunt you know i'm a machine yeah. it, it's nonsense it's total nonsense but like in my mind it was already going very well you know when i got this bonus of uh, getting to be the machine gunner so how'd you like the m60 compared to the 240 I like lo- so the 240 is a better machine gun. It's it's a it's a better built you know it's better engineered, more reliable. Um, there's things about the M60 though um, that made it a better well that you know it's a trade off right. So you get you get more reliability, um, sustained rate of fire for longer with the 240, but with the M60 easier to assault fire and and it really was a weapon that you could. You know, uh, it was a, 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 it was a crew serve weapon, but one guy could employ that weapon system. You could assault fire it. You could like, and we, tra- you know, it was part of the uh, drills we would do. Is like you, you put the stock of it like in your thigh, and like you know, you have you seen guys do with the 240, but mm-hmm. with the uh, M60, it's meant for that. It had a forward grip on it, um, and you know, I I like the M60, but you know, I wasn't a machine gunner that long, only a couple years, and then. Uh, by the time I had anything ever to do with machine guns again, it was long time in the future. Is actually as a Marsoc guy when I had to touch machine guns again, and then it was the 240, and I had to kind of like learn from scratch. So, yeah, for sure, that sucks. That coming into it, you're like, well, I'm a machine gunner, I should know these guns, but now it's a new set of nah. weapons. Now you got to relearn everything. 240 yeah. is a great gun. I know everyone, you know, most of the guys I've talked to that that have used them. They prefer that one, like for actual combat patrols and stuff like that, like vehicle mounted and stuff. Oh, 50 yeah. 50 cal is great, but the 240, like the rate of fire is awesome. The range is really good on it. And you don't have to worry about punching through, you know, multiple walls if that's a concern and stuff. Whereas 240, yeah. you know, you don't have that. So, yeah. <clears throat> so how long were you there before you guys started working up for your first deployment? Uh, just long enough, not that long, just long enough to go to like CACs and like um division uh machine gunners course like a couple little things maybe six or eight months um and then i'm then we're off on the on the on a a mew i can't remember which i think it was the 15th mew i went out with the first time but anyways out on the ship on the uss essex uh maiden voyage which was which was cool yeah it was cool because um you know when it's a maiden voyage of those ships they want to pull it into as many ports as they can yeah so it was like you, you know i'm by the time we got on the boat, I'm 18. Maybe I was, yeah, I was still 18. But like, just brand new, you know, kid, get on that boat, and it's like Hawaii, Singapore, uh, Kuala Lumpur, you know, Malaysia, Thailand, fucking Dubai, like everywhere. Hitting we all just the went spots. Everywhere. Oh my god, yeah. So well, it was it was all those spots, and then 
you know, we ended up in the Middle East doing the whole, like, you know, go to Udari Range in Kuwait, do all that thing. We're in the middle of doing that, and the battalion commander, you know, basically calls everybody in and is like, hey, you know, the balloon went up, we're getting on the boat, and we're going to Mogadishu. And so we go do that, uh, you know, for a while, back on the boat, and then directly to Perth, Australia, hit Perth, Australia on St. Patrick's Day, nice. right? Get back on the boat, go hit Sydney, back to Hawaii and back home. I get back to California. I'm like, why Why would anybody ever get out of the Marines? Like, I don't understand what anybody's complaining about. That was the most amazing six months of my life. You know, it's like you fit a lot of shit into six months, right? But then, of course, all the salts and shit are like, dude, it's not normally like this, you idiot. Like, yeah. that was a very rare experience, you know? You had a nice booze cruise on that one. That's what I was expecting when I came out to the West Coast. Um, knowing I was <clears throat> coming to First Anglico with orders to go on the Mew, I was getting ready to start another yeah. workup. So I was like, well, it's not Afghanistan and Iraq, so maybe it'll be cool. You know, maybe I've done those two things, so let's try this. Maybe it'll be a booze cruise. Because on the yeah. East Coast, all I heard about was people going to Europe and all these sweet spots. Yeah. And we got to go to, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to go to a lot of places too, Singapore and, and Hong Kong and, you know, Kuala Lumpur also, you know, but it, I don't know. It was hard to, it was hard for me to justify, you know, the, the misery of living on a ship. So I don't know. And yeah, we got it, lucky, we got lucky and got off and, and at Udari range and the rest of the ship got, or the rest of the Mew got pulled away and they were end up at sea for like 115 days straight while we were while we yeah. were in kuwait just still working dude and you know how it is man if you're on the boat as a boot uh i had an interesting story so i had to a mess duty for whatever you know 30 days or something when we yeah. first got on the ship because i'm fucking lance corporal uh but i didn't you know they teach you the navy ranks and recruit training but i didn't give a shit you know and i spa i data dumped them like i didn't remember any of them right i of didn't course. care and so now i'm in the in the galley and it's the and uh, by the way I was back then I was like a jarhead like horseshoe hind tight like I took I was like a robot like a little marine robot you know a little like lifer mini lifer yeah. you know so yeah. I, so so I already have like you know they the all the brainwashing shit was in full effect like if you weren't an infantry person you know an infantry man I didn't want anything to do with you and if you were in the <laughs> navy I definitely didn't I definitely didn't want anything to do with you but I I didn't understand that that's the the navy's galley right. And it was the first, like, Thursday we're in there. It's field day. And so, uh, you know, these petty officers and shit are bossing us around. And this guy tells me to wash the uh, rubber mats that you, that you the non-slip floor mats, to wash them in the cauldrons that we cook the food in. And I'm like, that's gross, man. I'm going to go wash them in the fucking thing where we wash the dishes. And he's like, no, put them in the fucking thing. We're going to boil them. I'm like, dude, that's where we cook the food, you know? So I get in an argument with this guy, and he kind of gets in my face, and he's, like, pointing at me, like, put them in the fucking thing. And I'm like, a uh, Navy guy is now threatening me. So I'm like, hey, get your finger out of my face or I'm going to beat your fucking ass. We go back. I'm start. Well, I didn't understand. He was a petty officer first class, right? Mm. So I start, you know, motherfucking this guy and all hell breaks loose. Next thing you know, there's three Filipino dudes in khakis, the chiefs, like standing around me screaming at me. Then the next thing I know, my staff sergeant comes down, my platoon sergeant, and he's screaming at me. And I don't, I'm like, hey, what, this Navy guy was you know, fuck this finger guy. in my face. Yeah. And the staff sergeant's <laughs> like, Hey, you fucking idiot. He's the same rank as me, dude. You know, basically. And yeah, then yeah. I, I earned myself another two weeks of mess duty. And it was, I was real close to getting in captain's mass though on my first like fucking two weeks in, 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 on float. But dude, a lot of guys get in trouble on ship over just, just the being close to each other and not being able to like release any kind of stress or anything. Yeah. Everything starts to set you off after a little while and stuff like that. And hmm. I don't know how it was when you were on ship, but when we got on the Macon Island, man, my first Mew, we were, the Navy people were not happy to see us on their ship. They did not like what kind having of the ship, Marines. Uh, what it was kind of LHD. ship is the Macon Island? LHD, okay. Yeah, so it's built to literally carry Marines around. <laughs> yeah, your job is to drive Marines around. For sure. And, but they didn't, they did not like us, man. And, You'd have dudes, you'd have Navy guys like trying to shoulder check Marines, like walking down the, the <laughs> passageways and shit like that. And it was like, dude, what the fuck is this? You know, yeah. they would do the whole green blue, like this is a Navy line. This is a Marine line. Knowing that the Marine line's like a thousand Marines. And, you know, it's just oh, dude, all the little shit. And it's all little stuff that just starts to set you off. And it's like, fuck this, you know, like, ugh. well, and it's it's not uh, it's not much different than I imagine, like a prison, uh, no. like a kind of minim a minimum security prison, you know, like, yeah. 
Yeah, and you can't get away, you know, from anybody. There's nowhere to go, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And if That's... you're a Marine, anywhere you try to go, you know, I'm sure you've you've experienced this where it's like, get out of the burden area. We're doing field day. You know, you got to go fuck off. And then everywhere you try to go on the ship to like just be, somebody moves you. They're like, you can't be here. We're about to yeah. do whatever. We're about to move the helicopters. Fuck off. And then hey, just everywhere you go, someone tells you you can't be there. So you just kind of wander the ship like nomads, you know. They're doing firefighter drills or they're cleaning <laughs> yeah. or something's going yeah. on, man. Yeah, it is like a minimum security prison for sure. That is, that's what I tell people. I'm like, dude, it's about as close, I think, as you can. Now, having never been to prison, I yeah. can imagine that's about as close as you can get to being in prison because you get shitty food. You just, your your life goes by the whistles, you know, like you're listening oh, yeah. to the whistles, telling the time yep. and shit. Like, uh, anyways. So, yeah. um, you said you, you said you went to Somalia, man. What was going on in Somalia? Uh, so, in it was, uh, yeah. So, this was, um, not, too long after the ranger regiment and delta had gotten in their thing mm -hmm. i uh, matter of fact that that all happened when i was in recruit training so you know mm. it, it was less than a year previous to when we got there that all went down now what we were there to do was cover the un withdrawal so they were finally pulling out all the like italian and pakistani troops were pulling out of mogadishu mm -hmm. so they put the mu ashore for a few days um to cover the withdrawal. So we held static security positions in, on the beach in Mogadishu and then the new and old port. Um, I was on the beach. Uh, and again, this is 1994. I'm a Lance Corporal machine gunner. And, and honestly, compared to like pr subsequent combat experience, like this is the least amount of information I ever had going into anything. It was basically like what I, what we were told was, Hey, because we landed in uh, LCACs, right? And they said, when mm. you get off the LCAC, this is my squad leader telling me this shit. He's like, hey, you're going to see me swinging a red chem light. Just fucking walk to where I am. I'm going to collect all you dickheads up. We're going on a little march down the beach. And at various intervals, I'm going to fucking put you on this berm. And then you and your dickhead buddy are going to dig in. And that's that's all the information I got to start with, right? So it's like, okay, look for a green, look for a red chem light. Follow Sergeant Lowe. He's going to point to a place, and then I'm going to dig a hole and set up my machine gun. Got it. Be ready and that go. was it. You know, That was it. And so, uh, you know, you got some ROE, but uh, that was kind of interesting because, you know, they had come uh, come into each birthing area, like one birthing area at a time, the intel, like the Mew intel guys. And they had a bunch of documents and photographs and shit of the what had happened to the Rangers. So they had pictures of, like, fucking dead uh, Army Ranger guys and – a bunch of really dramatic shit to show us basically to show us and be like hey this is what's out there you know what i mean so you need to be taking this seriously this is a real thing you know yeah and then our i remember specifically our battalion commander we, we'd all been issued a roe card like a little laminated card that said you know what what the rules of engagement were we got in the folks on the ship like one company at a time would fit in there so he gave this speech you know over and over again but when, when we got in the folks he's like all right you know hey we're going ashore to do this thing it's like, I want everybody to take out their ROE card. You had to have it in your left breast pocket, right? Pull out the ROE card. He's like, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it. They've read it. Great. He's like, put it away. We all put it away. He's like, I don't give a fuck about that card. Uh, if you feel like you're, uh, if you're in danger in any way, I want you to employ your weapon system until it's fucking empty. Any questions? And we're like, dude, rad. Be like, that's cool. You know, like. He, this guy doesn't give a fuck about the ROE. Something nobody would ever tell you now. Like, there's no fucking no way. Like, but the other thing that was going on was, and I didn't know this at the time till after, but, you know, the press that was going to be there um, was all sequestered in one, like, penned-in area in the port. So they could see what was happening in their vicinity directly around them at the port. Mm -hmm. And I think the guys at the port had different instructions than we had, you know. But everybody else was just told to, hey – Go, go hold these positions. We weren't maneuvering. We weren't patrolling around in the streets or any of that mm -hmm. shit. It was literally like static positions. And um, the only thing that ever really happened w where I was at was the two um, warring tribes in Mogadishu. It's like the – I used to know like uh, – I can't remember the, the two factions that were, you know, antagonists of one another in Somalia. Well, what, what started to happen is as all these troops pulled off of like the airport, for example – they fucking descended on it, and it was like a bunch of meth addicts. They were they wanted to rip out all the uh, copper piping and shit. They just wanted to loot the airport, right? Yeah, yeah. But they would, but, but they're fighting each other over the the opportunity to loot the airport. Well, every once in a while, 
like an RPG or like a burst of fucking RPK fire or something would come over our lines. They definitely weren't trying to fuck with us. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> when that would happen, the fucking Mew would fire the FPF into the fucking city, dude. Like oh, geez. one RPG flies over and it's not just like Aaron with his M60. It's like the fucking LAVs, the Amtraks, basically everybody would just go nuts for a minute and then someone, you know, and then it would stop. And then, you know, it was, was just like out. a. It was about as good of a warning you could give them. Like, hey, man, don't be messing with this area over here. Do whatever you're doing over there, but not yeah. over here. Yeah, it was a. It, it was like a very interesting, or it was like a good intro to uh, combat because, you know, I, I is in my assessment of the situation definitely back then because you're 18, you don't care about anything. I'm like, yeah, there's no possible way I could get hurt. Like, this is, I'm a marine. Like. I'm obviously better than these guys. It's not possible. But literally nobody in the fucking whole Mew that was ashore got wounded or anything. You know, like we took zero casualties. It was basically like a one way, a one way fucking range for us, you know. But it was just like a very easy first like little exposure to. Yeah. Dip your toes into someone shooting around. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. How how long were you there for? A couple days, a couple weeks. Yeah, like five days. Okay. Okay, yeah. man, that had to have been real weird to just be bouncing from port call to port call, you know, getting your drinking on and stuff like that, and then and then going to the range, obviously, and then getting that call. Well, it wasn't weird for me because I had no context or frame of reference, and literally, I was very naive, and so I just, I was like, this is, yeah, because in my, I joined the Marines to go do shit like that, yeah, to yeah. like, to party and fight, you know, that was like what was in my mind, and I'm like, yeah, this is... As promised, here we are. Like, like this is cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's funny the way you put it at the beginning. Like, oh, why would anyone want to leave this? We get to go to port yeah. calls and hit random places to go. You know, maybe get in yeah. a fight. Yeah, That's was- crazy stuff, man. That's uh, you know, what a different time also because no cell phones, probably no. very limited computers. You know, if people uh, are we even didn't have you- any, no, no, no access to any computers on the ship. Um, that you know. They didn't have those phones like uh, on subsequent deployments. There would be like these pay phones by the gym. Yeah. There was none of that shit. Like, you know, someone's like fucking mom would die or something. And they'd be like, you got to go make a Mars call. And they'd have this like weird Mars phone thing that was actually like HF radio. But it like talks to some land based system. And it, it was just weird. The only talking, you know, calling home, it was like you'd hit port and you'd get your you'd have your like AT&T calling card mm-hmm. and you'd go out and you'd be on some like payphone in Hong Kong trying to figure out like the buttonology <laughs> to get it was just but I didn't give a fuck like you know I didn't have a family I mean I have parents but like they hear from I'd write letters you know like they used to make us write letters to, because uh people's it would it must have happened more than uh infrequently because you know p- people's parents would like contact the command and be like i haven't heard from johnny in four fucking months what have you done with my son and then the first sergeant would come down to the birthing area and be like all right fuckers everybody go get an envelope like boot camp an envelope yeah. a sheet of paper write your fucking family a letter right now i don't give a fuck just tell them you're alive i'm tired of hearing this shit <laughs> like that's all right, funny man. and now letters are like what someone sent me a letter yeah that's why weird. would you write a letter like who cares yeah send me an email like i'll get yeah. on i'll get internet at some point here you know either on Dude, ship I bet, I or I bet you dudes have Wi-Fi in the birthing area, for all, for all I know. You know, man, there's some smart kids out there. I wouldn't surprise me. You know what? I think I want to say some of the ships have a Wi-Fi capability on them now. That's what I'm saying. I bet they do, yeah. I think some of the newer ones do, but I th- it's probably super limited because that is a threat. You know, that's obviously a oh, SIGINT threat. Dude, if, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was always like a warning. Anytime we'd go through like um, certain areas, I'd say – they would be like, everybody's got to have all their electronics shut off. You know, we're trying to reduce yeah. any kind of signature. And, yeah. yeah. So what was what was next for you, man, after after that first pump? Like, whew, you know, that was a good time. What's up? Well, so a couple of things happened on the deployment. I They had a, um, a, a battalion uh, board for corporal. And I won the fucking thing. So I'm a boot, and then I get promoted meritoriously to corporal on the deployment. Well, now I'm fucking weapons company's guy. You know what I mean? Like, they, they didn't promote me to corporal so that I could go anywhere. You know, they're like, cool, we got this dude. He's about it. You know, he's a good little infantry dude. Made him a corporal. So they send me to squad leader school right off the bat, which, in like, now it's funny to me. But, like, back then it was like, holy shit, I'm, get, I'm getting sent to a school. Like, nobody went to any schools in the grunts for, you know, like, 
uh, guys I didn't know about, like state sniper platoon guys and shit. But in my little world, like nobody went to schools, you know? Like, yeah. Well, and if they, they did, it was probably like division schools, right? Like the very yeah. Basic yeah. Stuff. I mean, like a like a re- like squad leader school was like a, a big deal, right? So, I but I go to squad leader school, but before they sent me to squad leader school, I had to do this uh, static display, like a dog and pony show. Some dudes, some old Marines from like the Korean War were coming to tour Camp Horno, so we had to like do this thing, right? Uh, like a like a uh, you know lay out all of our equipment so they could look at its thing. So I was on the machine gun um, static display. And uh, I had I had no exposure to the uh, Scout Sniper Platoon during my workup, and I wasn't anywhere near them. They were on a different ship. They were on like the little the little deck. I didn't see these dudes in Somalia. I had no, nothing to do. I didn't. I knew that that they existed, but I didn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. I'm standing at the static display, and I look over, and there's a dude in a ghillie suit with a Barrett 50 cal, and then there's another dude with these weird camis with like pockets on the fucking arm. They just look insane to me, right? And I'm like, I'm doing the stack display with this uh, sergeant that's like in charge of the shit for weapons company. I'm like, hey, sergeant, what's the fuck those guys doing? He's like, dude, shut the fuck up, man. Like, that's the sniper platoon guys. I'm like, what the fuck? How do you get into that? And he's like, you don't, motherfucker. They only take 0311s over there, and you're a 31. I'm like, what? And actually, that that was true at the time. Like, th- those dudes were so, like, insane that they only wanted 0311s to be in the sniper platoon. Eventually, though, they had to they had to widen the aperture a little bit because they couldn't get enough people. Yeah. And so I saw these dudes, and I was interested. I was like, and then every time I would ask about it, whoever I asked would tell me some wild fucking story. Like I asked one guy that I thought would know, and he's like, "Oh yeah, man, you have to you have to sleep in a tree for a week in order to get in all this like weird shit, right? Like, <laughs> but nobody could say exactly like how how the whole thing went. So I ended up finally um, figuring out where the sniper platoon dudes were in h and company, and I just went and found them. And I was like, hey, wh- wh- what are you guys, what is this shit? Like, well, how do you become a scout sniper? And they're like, well, you come to one of our indocs, which was three weeks long at the time, and if you pass and you get in the platoon, you got to be an, other, you know, an expert, you know, current expert, and like PFT, all sort of shit. But I met their like basic requirements, and I was interested. Well, so I go to, I go to uh, squad leader school. I come back and the sniper platoon was have was about to have an in dock like you know in the next couple of weeks or something, so I go to the uh, weapons company you know my company gunny basically and I'm like hey I want to go take this sniper platoon in dock and he's like yeah over my dead body dude like we just meritoriously promoted you we sent you to squad leader school you're our guy like no absolutely not yeah and so I was discouraged you know and I'm like fuck and so um, they had that in dock and I couldn't go. And then a little bit of more time went by. They didn't get enough people for that indoc. So a couple months later, they ran another one. Well, at this time, my company Gunny was gone. I think he was at a school or on leave or something. I don't know where he was, but he was gone. So I just signed up for this thing, went to the indoc, right? I'm like two weeks into this fucking indoc, and the company Gunny comes back, finds out I'm there, and loses his mind, right? Comes over to H&S company, tries to raise a bunch of hell. And this is all kind of happening unbeknownst to me. Like, he finds out, comes... Well, the H and S company gunny is senior to the weapons company gunny, right? Mm, yeah. So he and they'd already figured out. I was only a couple weeks into it, but I think they'd figured out that they were going to keep me because you go through this whole three week thing, and at the end, kind of arbitrarily, just based on whatever their feelings are, they either take you in the platoon. It's very informal. I think it's different now. I think they they're more professional about it. But you know, some of the guys I was in this thing with. Uh, we got to the end, the three weeks, and they're like, no, you go, you know, fuck off. You can't, we don't want you. So but I think they'd already figured it out. So they were able to, like, kind of big dick my company, Gunny. Mm-hmm. So I get in the platoon, but I remember the sniper platoon sergeant, when, when he took me in, he's like, if you're smart, you're going to stay far the fuck away from, I can't remember the Gunny's name, but, like, whatever that Gunny's name is, they're like, that yeah. dude, hates, he hates you now. They want to kill you over there. So... You're with us now, but don't go anywhere near weapons company for a while till that dude's gone. I'm like, all right. Yeah, for sure. He just hooked you up, and now you're yeah, you're yeah. staying away and to I, somewhere and, else. And, and now, of course, I totally understand like <clears throat> his perspective. But at the time, I was just like, I want to do what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and I've said it multiple times on the podcast. People that seem to have the best time in the Marine Corps, or maybe in the military in general, might you know I'm specific with the Marine Corps, but the people that seem to have the best time in the military and go to the best schools and stuff like that are the guys that put themselves out there and like make it happen instead oh, of waiting for someone to be like, all right, you can come to this school or all right, you can do this. Sometimes you got to open some doors on your own, you know. You have to be the squeaky wheel, and you know, um, 
there's a lot of haters. Uh, yeah. You, I encounter, you know, you encounter it, and you and you talk to guys that go recon or Marsock or whatever. They they they'll tell you like you'll encounter people that will try to put obstacles in your way just because um, they're just you know just whatever causes a hater to be a hater. You know, it's like they're, you know, they in a lot of cases like you'll run into guys, especially with the sniper thing. You know, you'll run into people that tried even when they were younger, you know, like as a corporal or something, they tried to go to the end dock and didn't make it. So now they're like a staff sergeant or a gunny in the grunts and they're they don't like snipers, you know, because yeah, they a feel bunch like of cowboys. They gotta, yeah, a bunch of shit birds or they fuck me in some way or whatever. So um but I I had very little of that though. Um mostly any opportunity that I pursued in the Marine Corps, I was I didn't I was able to go with that with a minimum amount of like people trying to stop me, you know? Yeah. You're right though. There are haters out there. I mean, and, and all walks of life in, yeah. you know, in, in our own, in my own community, the, the JTAC community, the non JTAC 0861s. Oh yeah. That become like the senior staff NCOs. A lot of those dudes hate all the JTACs, you know, and it might yeah, be because, because they were never one or whatever happened. They didn't make it well, through the school. And because JTAC or well, angle code JTAC, that's another kind of cowboyish type of thing. Like you're out there um, on your own a bunch. And then, you know, angle code guys, you're working with all kinds of other joint. You know, you're out with some British dudes who are real chill. So now you're being real chill. And next thing yeah. you know, you're fucking dressing like a dickhead out on the OP or whatever. Like it's that <laughs> kind of thing where it's like minimum supervision ergo you're you're not minimum supervision from like the headquarters but the highest amount of stress probably for everybody that's in the fucking in the unit dude and i'm sure we'll get into it but like you know uh i did a uh thing and you know i was a jtag in marsoc for a while and some of the most like like and and you know when it's an when it's not your primary job it's even more stressful because it's like this is this is one of my jobs yeah it's really not something that should be somebody's extra job it requires all of your fucking for attention sure. man. Yeah, yeah for sure i was never a fan of like when we so when we went on the mew with the anglico detachment the anglico detachment would would send some guys over to the recon detachment as like yeah. their fire support dudes to help them out yep. to bolster them up and then we would also the jtac e's and the more senior guys would also try to like kind of bring their dudes up to speed because like you said as a recon Marine or even a Marsoc guy, you, that's one of yeah. however, you know, how many schools you've been to. Oh, I'm a breacher. I'm a jump. I'm dive. I'm fucking, yeah. you know, like, and you yeah. have to maintain all these qualifications. And so it's, it was not anything against them. Their JTACs were not as good as ours, but that's just because oh. they have 15 jobs. And that's literally the only thing we were out there doing, you know, call well, for and, fire with artillery or blowing stuff up with aircraft. Well, and, and where I was doing it at Marsoc, like Marsoc knows that, right? So the, the, yeah. the, 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 you know, if I'm getting controls as a CSO JTAC, you know, I went to TACP, but a lot of the CSO JTACs went to SOTAC, but yeah. whatever. Like, if I'm um, getting controls in combat, it's because the Air Force CCT guy is not around or the uh, fires, we just call him fires guy. <laughs> like, it's a SOX, SOX, SOX whatever B. now. SOX B. Yeah, if, the, if, if we don't have, you know, by order of priority, it's, it's the SOX B or the CCT guy and then us, you know. Yeah, uh, sure. I just ended up in a team that had neither a CCT guy nor a fires guy, so we had two CSO JTACs. So, man, that's a that's a lot to add on because for those that don't know, when you go down range, you know, and I'm I haven't been on a team or anything like with what you guys do, but I I know plenty of guys that were. And when you go down range, you're not just a JTAC like calling in airstrikes. You're you're oh. planning aircraft. You're planning like Dude. logistical flights. You're planning LZs. You're plan. You know, it's, it's like crazy. It, and, and where I was doing it was out at, um, you know, a VSP site. So, like, out in the middle of nowhere type fob. Yeah. And everything that we drank and ate and all the fuel we burned had to fall out of the sky on bundles. Yeah. And that's the JTAC's job. You know, it's like you're the one that's clearing that drop. Anytime we did, like, a milk run, we'd go up to uh, Sangin District Center a bunch on ground movements, right? Well, okay. you're not leaving the wire without a JTAC. It's mm-hmm. just, so, if you've got two JTACs, and something's going on at the at the fob, but someone else is going on a milk run. Somebody's going on that milk run, right? So it's like, it, and it might be during you know what would otherwise be like your downtime or something. Mm-hmm. And then you know how it is, but like before you go out on a mission, 
um, if you're the JTAC, like while everyone else is in their rest cycle, because we do like a reverse, you know, cycle type thing. So they're sleeping prior to insert. You're basically sitting around waiting for the motherfuckers to email you the spins and like to source the stack so that you can make your products. And, and like, because I knew that like I couldn't, um, I didn't have enough experience to wing shit. I was very anal about like pre- uh, man, it's been a while since I thought about this shit, but pr- I would like, pr- I would pre-make these like cards or whatever mm, that yeah. would have like the, the actual aircraft that I know were sourced or whatever. And then I would know generally like where I was going to stack. I would try to get as much of that, you know, put out on this paper so that when shit was going crazy, you know, I could, I could, I, I wasn't that good at keeping all that complicated shit, safety of flight information and who's here and where's that and all this other bullshit. The mo- the, to the degree which I could get that stuff down on a product before going out there was would was a big benefit to me. So, I, you know, I would be waiting up, waiting for all that shit to happen and, you know, it would fuck with my rest and everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of gear, radios, you oh, know, dude. you got to be ready for, for everything. And, and you're right. Like getting getting those products and all the little stuff you know, tying up all those loose ends really does dividends downrange because it not only helps you, but it helps all the aircraft too. If you send all that information out to them beforehand and you're all looking at the same game plan and then you can just give them whatever updates as soon as they show up like, Hey, I know we are going to hold you here, but this is what happened. You're going to be holding here now or whatever. So uh, let's back up though. Let's go back to, we'll, we'll we'll come back into the JTAC stuff here in a little bit, but so you got pulled over to, was it considered, was it called Stapleton then? Yeah, the, Stapleton. Yep, Scout Sniper Platoon. Yeah, but back then we we called it Stapleton. So Surveillance and Target Acquisition Platoon. How many? How, what percentage of that platoon was school trained snipers at the time? Now we're talking mid nineties uh, time frame. Yeah, mid nineties. So when I got there, um, you know, you know, there's some turnover guys come and go, but the the senior guys that were running the platoon at the time, you know, there's probably like four or five sergeants that were the that were scout snipers. A couple of corporals and lance corporals, and then um, out of a, the platoon was only like 18 people, yeah. and I'd say seven or eight of those guys were school train school trained snipers when I got there, and then you know it would reconstitute, and then hopefully by the time you go out on a, a deployment again, you've got most of the guys through school is the idea, mm-hmm. and then you'll have a couple you know guys here and there, but there was some other rules back then that made it more difficult, so. If you um, failed sniper school twice, you were never allowed to go back again. I don't know how they fucking come up with this shit, but if you failed twice, you were never allowed to come back again. So you were what was called a permanent pig, right? So we call the guys that are graduates of the sniper school a hog, hunter of gunmen. It's all pretty juvenile, like, looking back on it. But at the time, I took this shit very seriously. This was like my religion, right? So um, hogs were guys that had passed the sniper school. Pigs were professionally instructed gunmen, had not passed sniper school yet, didn't have the MOS, right? But there was guys in the platoon that were, you know, permanent pigs, but were excellent snipers. Like, they'd Mm -hmm. been to sniper school twice, but shit happens, man. Like, you could – stalking gets a lot of people or – and back then, it was less professional than it is now. Um, They would just drop you if they didn't like you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They would just – and it was not a formal school. It was a a, – it was a billet MOS. It wasn't like – now it's 0317. It's an actual MOS. Back then, it was 8541. So it it was like – they could have a high attrition rate at that school, and the Marine Corps didn't care. There was no, like, men requirement for school-trained snipers. There was a requirement to have a sniper platoon, but the Marine Corps, they then they were rolling around about the about 70% attrition at that course, um, you know, during the 90s. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a legendary school for a reason, right? You know, it's got all the... Uh the stories yeah. from all the years it, of it, people going and failing or making and telling how it was there. And it was definitely, I was, I was like very intimidated to go there. Um, before you, the way we used to do it at first Marines is you had to go to a, uh, a, a regimental pre sniper course. It was like six weeks long. Right. And you had to, um, kind of pass that in order to get a quota. Well, uh, at the, while I was at the regimental sniper course, the division school, the actual MOS providing school was graduating. So they're like, Hey pigs, we're going to go. There was two dudes from the, from my platoon that were graduating. They're like, Hey, we're going to go um, watch sniper school graduation. It was over at camp Margarita at the time. So we go over to camp Margarita for this graduation, go into this room. And it, the, the classroom was insane. It was like huge red, like looked like Nazi SS bolts on the like uh, beams on the top of the thing. 
Um, there was like seven dudes graduating. They all were emaciated. They had black eyes and busted up faces because they'd gone out drinking the night before and gotten some big fucking fight. <laughs> two of them were – so there was like seven dudes. Two of them were SEALs. Two of them were dudes from my platoon, and then there was like a couple other guys and then the instructors. But just, I don't know, something about it, I was like, oh, I'm never going to pass. This looks fucking insane. Like, these people are lunatics, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is, I was very intimidated to go, like, I was, like, scared to go to the school, you know? Like, I didn't, I was, like, nervous about it, you know? And, like, um, but. So how'd you get past that? I mean, is it one of those things where you're like, well, I have no choice now. I have to go, yeah. you know? Well, I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to be a, you know, a scout sniper. I wanted to stay in that platoon. I, I the thing about, um. The thing about going to the sniper platoon was I, I it was an opportunity to really specialize and the thing I liked about it right off the bat like right as soon as you get there even during the end doc you're doing a bunch of stuff by yourself or with one other dude mm -hmm. so that was the first time going to that end doc it was the first time in ever in the Marine Corps they're like gave me you know a sheet with some grid locations on it and they're like go find the bot you know land nav but it was like the other side of the fucking base you know and I'm like wait I'm gonna you're gonna let me walk cross camp Pendleton by myself like this is I was so used to having my platoon of everybody else with me and then yep. staff and NCOs staff NCOs and officers watching my every move constant management you know how it is in the regular Marine Corps so that I knew right away that if if every even if everything else sucked it was worth the price of admission being there because I was I was trusted to be you know, doing shit by myself. And I loved that part of it. I was like, dude, I'll do land nav all day, every day. Like I'm basically just out wa walking around the hills, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, for I, sure. So I really wanted to stay, I really wanted to pass. So, you know, and, and it, you know, I, part of it was, I was young too. So I was like a little more easily intimidated by shit than I am now. But, um, and then, I, you know, honestly, like I, ha they tell you like, well, in my platoon, they, they tell dudes, they're like, Hey, look, we have a, we think you have a reasonable chance of passing the school. Most guys don't get through it the first time. Do your best. Well, it's very common to booger up the first time and recock and go back. So don't don't fucking trip. You know it's it's gonna be cool. Because by the time you're in the platoon, they kind of um, they're real fucking dicks when you first get there. Like you know during the end doc, they're trying to dissuade you from being there. They try to make sure you really want to be there, right? But once you're in mm -hmm. the platoon, even as a pig, they're like, you know, it's you're you're a small tight platoon, so. You know, they they kind of knock off That's, the bullshit. I mean, I mean, once working in a, once you've gotten into something like that, an environment like that, it's got to be hard to come back to, a, like a regular rifle platoon or anything like uh, that, where it's like big Marine Corps, where you're you're just another cog in the wheel. Because generally, a PFC Lance Corporal is just a robot doing whatever they're told to do by their you know corporals, sergeants, and, and whoever else is above them. But like you said. In a, in a unit like that where you're in the sniper platoon or even an Anglico or if you're over at Raiders or Recon, you're – the level of expectation is much higher. The missions are much more difficult and the leeway is given to you because it's like, hey, man, here's kind of the end state we need you to do it. You know, this is what we need. Go make it happen. And yeah. that's really the only way to do it, in my opinion. I mean, I would much rather do that than have someone standing over me like directing everything I do. Yeah, yeah. It it pays to specialize. The, I, I think another uh, another important lesson I learned from that time period was when I first showed up over there to H and S Company. Like I said, I was like Moto Man, like Jarhead, fucking robot guy, right? It's horseshoe high and tight, life and people out. You know, especially when I picked up Corporal. Like all of a sudden, all my Lance Corporal buddies weren't my buddies anymore. You know what I mean? Like I was very serious. Um, and I didn't, and I had a thing about pogues, you know what I mean? Like if you weren't an infantryman, there was something wrong with you in my estimation of reality. So I get over to the sniper platoon, I get in the platoon and you know, we're in H and S company and I'm like doing my fuck pogues thing. And the other dudes in the sniper platoon that had been there, they're like, no, 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 what are you doing, dude? Calm down. Like, Hey, these are our, I'm like, why are we hanging out with these calm guys and supply guy? What the fuck? And they're like, look, these are our buddies, you know, like you need to chill. And then I started this notice that. Uh, staple tune guys with the pack used to be at the battalion there wasn't like an eye pack like your admin guys were there in your infantry unit and so like these guys would go on leave and come back and like you know pre-deploying leave or something and then their leave didn't get you know their leave days wouldn't get taken out you miss in a piece of gear supply guys are just going to give it to you um you get on ship the cooks 
because we used to have cooks in the fucking unit. The yeah. cooks, instead of waiting in line for chow, they're bringing you chow from the wardroom, you know, from the officers. They bring it into the bird. Yeah. And, like, every time we did a helo shoot about the Barrett, we invited people from H&S Company. So we'd cooks, bakers, and candlestick makers. We'd bring them out to the range. And that I once I learned that, that stayed with me the rest of my career. Like, everywhere I go, I still do it now. Like, I am my first move is to like be make friends with like at, you know everybody i don't care what they do you know what i mean like it doesn't matter i got over that um that pogue bullshit real quick in a very self-serving way and initially <laughs> i'm like oh we can get shit from these people but then i realized i'm like well and then i you get to be friends with some of these guys like supply guy or whatever i'm like you know what yeah it's, it's lame it's lame to be in supply kind of like you're stacking boxes all day but that dude right there he's good at being a supply guy like he's takes pride in Whatever it is, he's you know. There's people that are just good, at, good at what they're doing, even if what they're doing is seems fucking lame. It's not lame if you're if you're excellent at it. You know what I mean? So, I and those relationships are what help you get a comp, you know accomplish these missions too, because it's oh, like, hey sure. man, we got this last minute tasking. Can you help us out and get us da 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 da? And you know, and these people that you weren't dicks to, you know, you brought yeah. into the family of like, hey, one team, one fight. Are like, yeah. yeah, let's get it done. Let's get this done, you know, because it's one yeah. team, one fight. Even though they're the support guys, I've been the yeah. pogue. I've been the pogue. My I was a pogue my entire career, you know. But it is what it is. Again, a lot of guys that are are like serious about it, like fucking pogues. Those are just the boot guys that really haven't had a lot of experience yet. And realize yeah, exactly. It's not a it's not a very mature perspective, you know. But <laughs> also, when you're a little young infantry guy, that's part of the like, yeah. Uh, like the whole vibe, you know, it's like, yeah. and you do like, it helps you, uh, it helps you, um, deal with the, uh, extra bullshit that comes with being, I mean, I love, like, I, I really enjoyed being in the grunts. Like I didn't hate it, you know, like, and I, I was there almost, it. I didn't hate it. Like, uh, I was there almost 10 years before I left to go to, um, recon, to go to force recon. Uh, and uh, and that was only because at a certain point you can't be a grunt anymore. They make you go do shit you don't want to do. You know, mm-hmm. like you you can't you can't just stay in the grunt. You have to go take a B billet or do other fucking dumb shit. I couldn't. Basically, I was not going to be able to be a scout sniper anymore, and that's what I wanted to be doing. So I'm like, I'm going to just do what I want to do again. You know, like that's the yeah. thing about the Marine Corps. That someone's always um, trying to tell you that you do what's um, for the good of the Marine Corps, and it's like. Okay, but there's a way to make what's good in the mer- for the Marine Corps and what's good for me line up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> there's, you know, I don't know what it is, man. There's people in like positions of power or uh, that they, they just don't care about like the human aspect of anything. And I get it, you know, mission accomplishment and things got to get done and stuff like that. But I remember, and I think I've talked about it on here before. I remember there was a time when I was at 10th Marines, we had two staff sergeants. Both of them were JTACs. Both of them were new JTACs. Both of them had done a deployment as an 0861 also before they were JTACs. One of them had come from Okinawa and was married to an Okinawan woman. The other one just got orders to go to Okinawa, and he didn't want to go. And this other dude got orders for whatever. And so yeah. they're like, well, let's call the monitors, you know, or let's call yeah. the monitor. We're staff sergeants. We can call the monitor and, and see if we can swap orders. Yeah. And the, the monitor was like, no, dude, you can't swap orders. And if you don't like it, then get out. And so the dude got out, and then the, they, they gave the other guy the orders that they he moved him denied. Anyway. And I'm That's- like, dude, so you just wasted a whole, like, asset that you fully paid for, trained. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of money to train guy. a JTAC. And yeah. you just threw him out the door because you want to be a douchebag about his, like, assignment. You know, and you don't want to have yeah. any kind of leeway. So, I don't yeah, know, man. It's- it's fucked up. And then you, the higher you get in rank, the more fucked up it gets. Because, like, if you're if you're like a master guns or master arm or something, it's like there's only, like, five places they can fucking put you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that it, those guys actually get a lot less leeway than, like, a, you know, lower enlisted guy. Yeah, because everybody's waiting on those dudes to get out so that they can move yeah. up the ladder, you know? That's right. Yeah. So, so what made you decide to get out? Is this at, this at the end of this enlistment is when you got out? Yeah, so in 1999... Um, I was pending orders to Okinawa to be a SOTG instructor, and I was down for that. Um, I was going to do it, but I was married at the time, and my wife at the, was like, no, I'm not moving to Japan. And I'm yeah. like, all right, I'll, I should try to make my marriage work, and I got and I got out. And it was like almost instantly upon getting out, I was like, I shouldn't have got out. Like, 
I I didn't get out be, for any like um because I was sick of being in a Marine or anything. It was just like, I kind of was, you know, how it gets, you get to a point where you can, you start imagining like what it would be like to not be in the Marines or whatever. But I was very naive still. I was like, okay, I'm going to be a, um, this is before there's any contracting shit. Like there is, you know, this is before you know, Blackwater or any of this shit. This is like 1999. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm a Marine scout sniper. We're the baddest fucking snipers on the planet clearly i can get a job as like a mercenary with like executive outcomes or sand line there was like like these south african and british mercenary companies that were doing shit in africa yeah. still this is like the, there there was very little of it though left right but i found out about it and i legit like i got out of the marines i legit made like these packets with like all my military information like an idiot i would never send people i don't know my just fucking who knows what what i was thinking but i really wanted to get <laughs> a job as like what would now be easy to get like contracting shit you know yeah like blackwater fucking you know sock whatever like that kind of shit but at the time that really wasn't happening and so <clears throat> so that's what i was trying to do what i ended up what ended up happening was i got hired by a company to do executive protection in the philippines so i had to go like i went to a school for that um except that i'm not i'm five six man i'm not in a fucking bodyguard you know um, so I was doing like the uh, counter surveillance, um, doing all the advances for like the the meets and shit like that, kind of like the ancillary, like supporting part of that. Um, so I did that for a while and then that dried up. Um, and then I was legit like working at rent a center, like repossessing fucking flat screen TVs in the hood and shit. <laughs> and uh, that's legit what I was doing. Like I was a credit manager just means you go take people's shit back kind of you're like the repo man you yeah. you install you bring it out there but also you take it back when they don't pay um and then 9 11 happened and i was like okay that clearly i must go back in the marines now like there's no i think i was kind of thinking about it anyway like maybe i could maybe i could go back in or you know maybe join the army or something as a and i was kind of thinking like maybe i'd be a go try to be a green beret or something um, but as soon as 9-11 happened, I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I need to go back in the Marines. I need to find myself back in a state platoon. And uh, that's what I did. How 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 hard was it for a prior service Marine to get in right after 9-11? Because obviously I, recruiting ramped up. Like, was it, a, was it a pain in the ass to come back in or I, pretty straightforward? I barely got back in. It, so I, uh, I had some self-induced drama. So 9-11 happens. The next day, I go into the recruiting office in in South Sacramento, and I'm overweight, man. I was like 200, probably like, I don't know, like 210 pounds or something, right? I was fat. And I walk in this recruiting office, and I'm covered in tattoos. Did I all? I got all of them in the Marines, but I'm like, like a fucking body suit of tattoos, right? So I walk in this uh, recruiting office, and I'm like, hey, country's under attack. I need to go back in the Marines. And this gunny in there is like, you need to do what, dude? Like, I'm like, yeah. He's like, you were in the Marines? I'm like, yeah, I was a sergeant, a fucking scout sniper. And he's like, come on, dude. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, hey, why don't you hop up on the scale there, stud? And it's like, I had lost track of like, it's like it creeps up on you when you get fat like that, I guess. I didn't see myself that way. Like, in my mind, I was still ready to go fucking go on a ruck run or something, right? Meanwhile, I had been doing none of that. Like, I was just drinking and hanging out. Yeah. Anyways, he, you know, he weighs me and I'm telling him, I'm like, I'm dead fucking serious, man. Like whatever it takes, I'm coming back in the Marines. He's like, well, what it's going to take is you got to lose about 30 fucking pounds. We're going to have to take a photograph of every single one of those fucking tattoos and send them in. It's make sure they're not gang related. I'm like gang related, dude. I got them all in the Marines. So that, and that's what I did in very short order in less than a month. Oh, and then here's the other thing. He's like, we have to get this done before this cutoff date in November because then I can't submit any new packages. I have only this window to, to do PCEPs. Yeah. Prior service. And you can't do body fat shit. You know, like you have to you have to weigh 170. It was like I had to weigh 170 pounds or whatever it was, 170, 170, something like that. He's like, you can't do tape like as if you were on active duty. I'm yeah. like, so I basically after that conversation, that was like the last thing I ate basically until, <laughs> until I went to MEPS and like swore back in, but it was like brutal, like basically starved myself. Um, you know, I'm in the 24 hour fitness with like trash bags on every fucking day. Like, and I'm working at the time at Renaissance center trying to like still pay my rent and shit. Um, but I really wanted to come back in. So that's I legit did. though, I, man. Ah, uh, dude, it was, it was brutal. Um, but 
I, it, it worked out, you know, it, it almost didn't work out because then I'm at MEPS. Um, so I'm sure everyone listening to this knows what MEPS is, but like, so we're, we're the medical screening for me to come back in, right? So I'm in there, I passed the weight part, so that's good. When I got to do the audiogram, well, my hearing at the time was already fucked from being in the Marines for six years. And so I failed the audio test the first time. And it's a civilian woman that's like running the machine. She's like, okay, if you fail, you have to go back and do it again. I fail it the second time. And she goes, you're not going to be able to, she's like, nope, you can't pass. You're not, you know, do not pass, go, do not go back in the Marines type of shit. And I go, lady, look, I go, lady, please. I just lost 30 pounds in like 30 days. I, the country's under attack. I'm just trying to go back in the Marines to like defend the country. I've already been in the Marines for six years. Like, I know my hearing is good enough to be a Marine because I just was one. Like, you got to do something. You got to help me out. And she's like, all right, go take the test again. Puts me back in the booth. And magically, this time, she's like, hey, good news. You passed. So she hooked me up. I'm That's like, cool. you're a good American. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your service, lady. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was the process like, though? So do you just like once you've done MEPS? So for those that don't know, that's the military entrance processing station. It's yeah. um, where you go to do all the medical stuff and everything. Once you did all that and the paperwork, obviously you're not going back to boot camp or anything. Do you just get no. orders from there and you just show up? Yeah, um, I had to work at the recruiting substation. So I swore back in that day. And here's the problem. I was uh, I did six years the, the first hitch. Mm-hmm. And I was in the below zone for staff sergeant when I got out because I had got promoted to corporal and sergeant really fast. So I was about to be a staff sergeant when I got out. Well, the deal they gave me when I swore back in was corporal zero time and grade. Mm-hmm. Like I got E4 with no um, time and grade. So, OK, well, I didn't care, though. You could have I they could have made me a PFC. I wouldn't give a fuck. Um, so I swear back in and then um the, the gunny in that substation is like, well, you have to work here and you're in the Marines again. So good. Congratulations. But now you work for me until your orders come in. So I had to work in this recruiting station for like two months. And then, uh, and then just, I got orders to, uh, second battalion, first Marines and at Horn Hill again. So was it weird coming back to base, like driving back on base? Like, Oh shit, here we go. Like I'm, what am I doing? Am I back here for real? Well, it was, I was, it, it was weird. But the other thing that was going on is in the interim, I had forced my brother, my little brother, to join the Marines. So he was, like, selling drugs and getting wild and shit. And I was like, nah, dude, you need to get out of this town. You need to go in the Marines. And then because I was a lunatic, my brother is, like, different different than me. You know, he's not wired the same. And um, uh, they had him talked into being, like, a some comm MOS or something. And I was like, fuck no. No brother of mine, no, my, my brother will be an infantryman. You know, I'm like being a dick about it. So I make him join the infantry. I make the recruit, have the recruiter change the thing, make him join the infantry. And then while he's in boot camp is when 9 11 happens. So now I got my little uh, brother is in the Marines to be an infantryman. 9 11 happens. My mom's fucking pissed. She's like, if anything happens to him, like it's on you. You made him do this shit. So I come back in the Marines and my brother's at, um, by then he was at SOI by the time I checked back in the Marines. So, so like I'm down there at Horno, he's at SOI. We're kind of like, you know, see him on the weekends type of shit or whatever. So that was kind of weird him being down there. And, but it, it didn't feel weird being, it felt cause I went right back to where I came from Horno. So it just felt like a couple of years I go, I've been gone for a couple of years and then I was back, you know, did you, did you, when you checked back in, were any of the guys that you knew pre- previously still in the unit? No, because I was in third battalion, first Marines um, when oh, okay, I left, gotcha. and then came back in second. And then, the and then, yeah. yeah so there was guys still in, in the Marines, just in different places. But no, I don't think there was anybody running around Camp Horno that I knew from from before. So, and because we and we, I guess we kind of skipped over. You went, you eventually went to sniper school before. Oh yeah, yeah. You got out, yeah. graduated yeah. from that. So that still yep. counted when you came back in, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all that shit. Yep. So did you get put right into the sniper platoon, or how did that yep. work? Yeah, so because um, I still knew guys that were in the, like, the scout sniper community is small. So once yeah. I knew where I was headed, um, I hit up somebody I knew to put me in touch with uh, the the platoon sergeant for that sniper platoon. And I was basically like, hey, man, I'm school trained, scout sniper. I was in 3-1. I'm coming back. Um, I'm expecting to go right into the sniper platoon and then, and then you're like, yeah, of course. And I think they probably like ask, you know, other guys that know me or something like, Hey, is this guy a scumbag or what? Yeah, and so I sure. showed back up and, and got right to work in the, um, 
sniper platoon. That's that's sick, man. So it says here you you deployed or you got you did deploy with them. Um, yeah, that's what and, I did. Uh, the inv- the invasion with them. So okay, so you want to talk about kind of the workup for that, kind of how you got the you know the word, and then what you guys did to prepare. Yeah, so I'm thinking back about we knew we. I think even by the time we started that workup, um, we knew that we were going to be. I think the. I think we knew that we were the the Marine Corps had already got the word that like we were going to be staging, you know, in Kuwait, uh, anticipating, you know, invading Iraq. So yeah. Um. So th- so that puts like and we had a truncated workup, like a kind of short one, um, and that puts everything into like perspective. You know, you're like, okay, I, I'm now training for something very specific. You know, or like mm-hmm. I'm training in in with the expectation I'm going to be using this stuff. So. Um, I, and during that workup, I got to go to the, um, scout sniper advanced course at Quantico. So, or advanced sniper, they call it that and the sniper employment officer course. So that was cool. And then we did like an abbreviated kind of, um, like a Mew type. Well, we were, we were with the Mew. So, um, we did like kind of a standard Mew workup. It was just shorter. And then, um, and then we actually rode the boat over to Kuwait. Oh, okay. Around yeah. the ship. Yeah. So. How is how is how does the advanced course differ from the basic course for sniper school? It, at least at the time, it's, it's different now. But yeah, it's different now, and it was different before I went. Um, there's been you know phases of that course before they really formalized all the scout sniper stuff. It kind of just depended on which group of lunatics was running what school <laughs> yeah. at what time, about what kind of experience you were going to get. I've heard from dudes that um, senior guys, you know from my platoon previously that like they went to advanced sniper course and it was like worse than worse, like more fit, more physical, more harsh than the the basic course. But in my experience, it was not because, you know, um, it's at Quantico, uh, the guys that run it, it's everybody there's already school trained scout sniper. The guys that run it are like your peers. They're like sergeants and staff sergeants. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a British, I don't think they do anymore, but they had a full-time British sniper guy. You know, the British guys would rotate through that. So you, it was cool to get, you know, their perspective on like how the Brits, the, the British Royal Marines uh, yeah, yeah. sent a guy there on like an exchange. And then um, you do some stuff at the FBI Academy, which is cool. You, you know, stuff that you don't get an opportunity to do regular in a platoon, like, you know, shooting through ballistic media, doing... Um, kind of some some of the ballistics and forensic stuff with the FBI, um, shooting through intermediate barriers, which I think the guys probably do now, but back then it was like kind of kind of cutting edge stuff. Yeah. Um, but and then also, um, you know, this the fucking thing was eight weeks long plus another two weeks for the employment officer course, and to be honest with you, there was a lot of like. <laughs> Okay, hey, it's the middle of summer. It's 100 degrees in Quantico. They've got two stocks scheduled for the day. Each stock's four hours long, right? We get done with that first one. Everybody's dick smashed from crawling on their face for four hours in the blazing sun. So the instructors would be like, well, guys, uh, we could go do the second stock in the other training area, or we could call it good and go get fucked up in the downrange club. Because there's like there's like a bar at a weapons training battalion. Okay. And they're like, it's chicken wings day. I say we go get fucked up, and then we would go drink instead. So it was not like that's not too bad. Know, to I me. Don't, yeah, I just I don't think it needed to be eight weeks, you know, to get. Mm. But I lo- I loved it because you know it was sh- shooting and hanging out and. I, I think it was, man. Yeah, exactly. Like I was I was cool um, to be out there, but uh, it was good. Um, and it, and a couple of the things there would become you know useful. Like it's a kind of a focus on urban, uh, urban sniping, which is, you know, all I ended up doing in Iraq was urban. Yeah. You know, there was no point where I wasn't inside an urban environment in Iraq. So. Yeah, makes sense. So I, I do yeah. want to hear. I do want to talk about how you guys were employed during that deployment to Iraq. Uh, but before that, can you talk about the breakdown of like weapon systems or how you guys were employed? Was it two man teams, four man teams, yeah. bigger? Can you kind of give us a, just bef- before we start talking about the actual deployment so we can kind of picture in our heads what yeah. you were actually doing? Yep. So this is, this is before a lot of the changes would happen. You know, once guys started getting into like around the Fallujah Ramadi um, time frame, they really started to understand that they needed to be taking more ass out yeah. <laughs> with their, <laughs> so they changed the TO a bit and stuff, but we were still operating off of the basically the TONE that Carlos Hathcock established when he set up sniper school post Vietnam, and that's 
that's not hyperbole. That's literally like how we were organized. Our tactics were based on Vietnam sniper experience. We were we were running that same routine until guys started to um, you know go into combat in Iraq and improve and innovate and stuff. But mm-hmm. we were a standard sniper platoon. We probably had like 20 guys in uh, two one. We had a uh, platoon sergeant and a corpsman and a lieutenant. The lieutenant was a 0203, so a ground intel officer, mm-hmm. not a school trained sniper. Never left. You know, he didn't go. He it may be different in other places, but our lieutenant was, you know, basically uh, the 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 S two alpha for the H and S company or for the battalion. Um, and we were in four. We were in four man teams that would break into two two man teams. So a four man team that would break into two sniper spotter teams, just like kind of Vietnam shit. Uh, these days, no no snipers are not going anywhere in two man teams anymore. That, that they just don't do that. Um, but we were still doing it. We were generally in um, in uh, general support of the battalion, but we would get tasked to be in direct support of uh, specific rifle companies. So, you know, I might spend a week uh, with the cat platoon doing something specific, and then maybe you know uh, they'd send they'd send the four of us to the India company, like one of the rifle companies, and then we'd break into two two man teams to support different squads there. Um, and we did well, a lot of like. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, say so what weapon systems were you carrying? Oh, yeah. So we had the M40. Uh, by then, we had the M40A3 sniper rifle. Um, we had a bear. We had a couple Barretts. So I can't remember how many is in a TO, a TO for a sniper platoon. I think there's like four or five M40 sniper rifles, a couple of Barretts, and then, you know, everybody else rolling around with M16s. Now, this is before um, the Marine Corps got good gear. So. Um, per the TO at the time, a, a, a scout sniper rated his M40 sniper rifle and an M9 pistol. He did not rate an M16. We're in Kuwait getting ready to invade Iraq, and th- and now we start thinking, I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this fucking pistol? Sniper rifle is not good for anything other than sniper rifle shit. Yeah. Uh, it's not a good. It's not a good uh, close range break contact weapon. You know that's mm-hmm. dumb. And this pistol, like I've shot this thing like twice in my life. I can't hit. I can't hit. I knew. I knew I couldn't shoot the pistol accurately. I like I knew that about myself, right? And I knew that nobody else in my fucking platoon could either. So, but I knew that we needed M16s, and we had to fight. We had to argue and fight and cajole just to get M16s. And the M16s we had were the full blown. Good to go, M16, M16 whatever. M16 A2, yeah. The flat motherfucker, that that whole deal. So that's what we went in with, with everybody. By the time it was all said and done, everybody had an M16. Snipers had their M40, which I carried uh, either in like a drag bag thing when I when I could and then sometimes just like slung on my back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then here's the other thing that people don't really realize is like we never used to train wearing body armor or helmet in a sniper platoon. Uh, didn't shoot with that stuff on didn't didn't it was like when you're in a sniper platoon everyone knew that you didn't have to wear that shit like the grunts would all be out doing their shit but you're in your boonie hat and you're like weird fucking you know chest rig thing and um so so we're in kuwait and this is the first time in my life anyone ever gave any us plates you know i'd never even had we used to just wear flak jackets with no plates in them. plates weren't a thing hmm. like you wore a you wore your Kevlar, whatever that, the interceptor that vest, soft right? armor, yeah, yeah. That thing that you put the plates in, the first time I ever even held one of those plates in my hand was in Kuwait, and they're telling us, you got to put these in your armor or in your vest. So we, we, like, did, and it was, like, we figured out real quick that, like, well, this changes the ergonomics of everything. I can't yeah. wear this fucking thing. So we shit canned them. We didn't shit can them. We put them in our rucks, like, hit them, you know? We just decided we weren't going to wear them. And then we're like, well... We can't wear fucking helmets. We don't shoot with helmets either. But the problem is, is when you actually start fighting, you're like, fuck, I really need to be wearing my fucking helmet. There's like frag flying around and shit, you know, and like, okay, this is a problem. So kind of on the fly, we were having to like, I would do a thing where it's like, I'd have my helmet on most of the time. And then like, if I thought I was going to be shooting, I'd have the helm, I'd like take the helmet off, which is bad juju. It's like not how I would do it now, you know, but like we're trying to figure all this shit out. So yeah, but that no, was, I mean, yeah. Early days of global war on terrorism. That's oh, a, yeah. a lot. That's a lot of what it was. Was figuring shit out, because all yeah. the old dudes, the most experience probably they had were 
there was probably like a handful of like crusty, crusty Vietnam guys still hanging around. Very few, but they're like at the highest levels now. Yeah. But the rest of them would be like Desert Storm. Me. Yeah. but yeah, they, And even Desert Storm, the thing was not to denigrate anybody's war or anything, but like that thing was over too fast for people to develop TTPs and shit, yeah. you know? Yeah, it was. It, there wasn't any sustained combat there, so we we were having to figure this shit out. And but you you know, you make do. And in my in my memory of the experience, like it didn't it didn't get in our way. Like the I love I love like a uh, Marine infantry. Like there's nothing like like what a Marine uh, infantry battalion or you know uh, um, you know a uh, uh, ground or what do they call that? Like an RCT or whatever. Like just the the pure like destruction that a uh, an organized Marine unit can bring yeah. is I, I like, I love, it. I like, you know, it's something that I would get into shit with guys at Marsoc about a bunch. Cause you get some people there that are like, they might've done like three years as like a generator mechanic or something. <laughs> and now they take, they go, it's no hit on them, you know, yeah. but they come to, they do go to ANS and now they're a Marsoc guy. And it's like, you, the shit at Marsoc is not like the rest of the Marine Corps. It's a totally no. different thing. And so sometimes guys would be like these fucking grunts or whatever and be like, Hey, Bite your fucking tongue, dude. Like, don't you dare. Like, don't you dare. <laughs> then again. I, and then you look at shit like what, what the grunts did in, like, uh, Ramadi and Fallujah and shit, and you're like, dude, you're not, like... For sure. There's a reason why, you know, the Marine infantry is what it is, so... Hey, if you're not an 0311 fucking kicking the door in, you're supporting him. Everybody that's behind it. that dude is supporting him, you know? That's true. Yeah, so, that's true. I mean, you just gotta... There's some guys that don't ever get over that kind of reality they get the you know they don't realize i don't know they just they don't like the fact that they're not like the cool guy or they're the you know they're not the focus oh, or dude. whatever but they are like yeah that you're right like it's always weird to me when people try to like 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 what they did wasn't enough so they try to like kind of kind of pump it, it up you know and, yeah. church it up a little bit and it's like no dude like that's dude and, and the cool thing about like uh, my that was a, a kind of a unique thing, like invading a country, you know, like you got, yeah. it's, it's a whole, you know, things that I'll never see again. Like, like being there in Kuwait, like as like the, um, the army was moving like all of their shit, like we were kind of near this MSR that was, and it would be like a solid day, like of continuous convoy, like of vehicles and tanks and shit just like rolling by and it's like you watch it and you're like holy shit man the united states of america just moved all that shit here from the other side of the world you know what i mean like our, our ability to project power and yeah. like nobody else can do that like it's we people have enough trouble like russia has its handful trying to like invade ukraine next door right yeah we sent all this shit from from america and then other places where it was staged you know and then Watching how the thing the Marine Corps is, you know, obviously kind of like, you know, unique and famous for is like our combined arm shit, right? So for sure. So and that's another interesting thing. So uh, we had a mission to kick the war off on our section of the berm, the you know Iraqi Kuwait berm. We had uh, three sniper teams, you know, a few kilometers apart from each other, staggered across the berm mm -hmm. prior to the invasion. We went up there like four days ahead of when we actually rolled through the breach. And there was um, uh, Iraqi mechanized infantry units, you know, in, in BRDMs and shit, actually driving around back there doing their shit. And so we refined uh, grid coordinates for them. And then we had a section of British self-propelled uh, artillery in support. And then each, each of our little fucking teams had like five minutes of dedicated time on those things. So I was like, like, a, um, like a linear sheath thing that I was just moving – up and down across these dudes for like five minutes, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like shit I'll never get to do again, like to kick. And then it was like, that all happened. And then the engineers, you know, came and, uh, put one of those bridging things, you know, over the, cause the berm had a trench on the other side of it. So mm -hmm. it was like, you know, put one of those bridging things down and then the whole mew just poured through the fucking breach into Iraq, you know? And I'm like, this is some shit, man. This is great. And then we waited until like the cat platoon came and like jumped in their trucks and fucking, you know, it was, it was, cool i was like damn this is That's we're, history, legit, man. we're legit invading a country right now you know i try to you know <laughs> I, I bring that up every time i talk to somebody that that was in the invasion i'm like 
you 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 took part in an event like you overthrew another country's government like yeah. is <laughs> you know say what you want about the reasons yeah, yeah. behind Not it or whatever but the actual yeah. event you you know you as an individual there you're just there doing what you're supposed to you what you're told to do but yeah. like you were part of a, this historic event that you know, not very many people ever have that kind of opportunity. I mean, I don't know. You can say it's good or bad or whatever, but it, either way, it's still like a historic event where I don't know. It's just it's it, you took part in stuff that are legit in the, every history book and will be for the yeah. you know as long as we're writing history books, I guess. Well, and it's, you, it's you a hit wild on thing. something. You hit on something that's like something I talk about a lot, especially like in the context of like you know, kind of what just what's happened in Afghanistan and like what's kind of happening with our country and our government and stuff. Like, it's very easy to like, look at these things in hindsight and be like, okay, you know, the, we should not have gone those places and done these things. Right. And you can make a strong case for like the whole thing being a boondog or whatever. Right. But I don't look at any of that stuff that way. Like I, I consider the whole, my whole experience in the Marine Corps to have been like a laboratory for my personal development. Mm -hmm. That's a very kind of like egocentric way to look at it. But to me, that's preferable than to be, me being like, what was it all about? And why did my friends get killed? And why did I do all this shit? And what that's I don't I'm not interested in that. I'm I'm in my in my perspective, those things were happening while I was alive. Right. And while I was like a young, you know, man, like where like where else could I have been? You know what I mean? Like there to, to it's just kind of like how I frame the whole thing. It's like I don't. You could convince. You could make a very valid case to me, right to my face. Some like leftist type of person could shake their finger at me and be like, "That whole thing was bullshit. You guys shouldn't have done that and everything." I'd be like, "You're you're absolutely right." However, I'm still glad I went. I still, it's you know, and not and and kind of for those reasons, like you said, like this is a a unique opportunity to witness these things and participate mm -hmm. in them, and you know, the great adventure, man. Man's great yeah, it's adventure. An adventure. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. It's a wishing for no war is like a it's a nice wish, but it's just not in the cards. Like there's yeah. literally been conflict for the entire time that men, you know, the yeah. humankind has existed because we're always looking for more resources or a better location for our people. And, you know, it's just that's just what it is. And then because of that, wars are going to happen. So I was the same way, man. Like I so when I first I tried to come in right after high school, uh, my senior yeah. year was in 2001. And it was like September 11th happened. And then me and a group of my buddies went to the recruiter's office that week. I got arrested in high school for having <laughs> weed. Um, so I got delayed a little bit. And it was one of those things where I like it kept like one roadblock after another. Like it was almost like it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. But I'm from a military family and it was just something that's all I ever wanted to do. And I was having mm -hmm. like dreams about not, you know, like and I almost just gave up on it. And it was like, all right, I got to try one more time. And if it's. You know, if it happens this yeah. time, then it's it. And if not, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. And I'm glad I did, man. You know, I only, I did 12 years and got out. And, and those 12 years, I got to experience a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of stuff that people outside of the military can never even imagine. And that's not combat necessarily. It's like, like I put a post on my Instagram the other day. Um, my buddy, Michael Farrell sent me a photo that one of the combat, um, combat cargo Marines took of the making Island breaking through the wake and you could see like the glowing, you know, the bioluminescence yeah, yeah. and by, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, dude, that's the kind of stuff you don't really get to see. Like, unless you're in that kind of, I mean, being out in the ocean in the middle of the Pacific ocean at night, there's no, there's no lights yeah. at all. So you'll never see the solar system like you will in that kind of moment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like these weird little, things these these moments like if you really appreciate them you know you can get a lot well, and, you can have a lot of good feelings about your time in the military well and think of think of some of the places you've been where even if you had all the money in the world you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily go you know like it's 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 like not all important exactly like well some people that's you may go there but like so, you know it, it's just and i think i think too many people don't um they don't they don't understand how valuable that can be like if you're if you're able to like tap into all that as a positive thing it's a resource mm -hmm. you know it's like but it's i think a, a lot of people yeah and but a lot of people veterans have a you know that's kind of a thing we talk about on a, our podcast a bunch is like what a, a different way to frame this shit because it's like um 
there you know there's these arc these like veteran archetypes you know like mm -hmm. oh i'm uh i'm i'm you know i've got pt you know here's here's one thing for people that your listeners to consider if they if they're struggling with this at all right there's this idea that like if you were a marine a, a military person you're in combat right um, you necessarily then have PTSD. And if you don't have some sort of PTSD, did you ever really go do some shit? It's kind of like, uh, I'm not saying PTSD is not real. I'm not saying people don't have it. But in some respects, I think I think a lot of guys indulge in it a little bit. I oh, think they for sure. buy into this archetype, you know, and maybe you could reframe all of that shit and look at it in a different light, you know, and, and um, get, more, get more positive out of it than the negative, you know? Yeah, well... PTSD is a crutch for a lot of people. It's a, it's an excuse to be a bad person. A lot of times, you know, yeah. you see guys get in trouble, get arrested and stuff like that. And it's like the first thing they say, Oh, PTSD. And it's like, yeah. dude, there's people that are like legitimately suffering from like PTSD. They seen some shit. They got into some fucked up stuff and it, you know, they're working their way through it. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a tough life for those guys. And for someone that's, yeah pretending to have an issue like that just to get like benefits or try to get out of something. It's just yeah. so shitty, man. You know, I hear about yeah. guys that get out and claim PTSD and they never, they may have, they may have done like one mu deployment or something like that where they just did like a booze yeah. cruise. And it's like, I don't know, man. I think everybody tries to maximize their VA claim on their way out. You know, of a course. lot of people do. Yeah. They want to try to get as much yeah. money as they can. And that's just one of those things that, people well, can claim because you can't you can't push back because what are you going to say like yeah. no you don't you don't have ptsd yeah. you liar because then you're the exactly. asshole yeah exactly and the, the system is pretty easy to exploit in that way for so. sure i mean i've known people my neighbor was a platoon sergeant he worked at wounded warrior battalion and um he's like man it's tough it's tough working there because these dudes like a lot of them are liars you know what i'm saying he's yeah, like they will yeah. sit here in formation and tell each other what they need to tell their therapist to get a an iPad because people come into that, come into wounded warrior battalion, these corporations and stuff. And they're just trying to be good people. Yeah. And they're like, Hey, we're going to give everybody an iPad. Hey, we're going to give everybody a hundred bucks. Hey, we're going to buy everybody lunch. Like these are things. And like some of these things require that you have certain things wrong with you to get yeah. to qualify. So people will tell yeah. each other like, Hey, say this and you can get this, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, yeah they're gaming it. Yeah. It's and you can't do anything about it. And again, like it's one of those things. If you try to push back and you go, "Hey, some of these people at the Wounded Warrior Battalion are fucking skaters that are just whatever," you kind of become the asshole because if you're wrong, yeah. if you're saying so and so's you know lying, but he's not, you know, it's a tough. Well, in heaven, yeah, it's a mind. In heaven field. forbid, like a commanding officer or something tells someone they can't be there because they don't yeah. believe them, and then they go do something fucking crazy. So yeah, like yeah. liability issues and stuff. But crazy stuff man it's it's just one of those things i i'm i'm all pot you know i'm not all positive i got out because i got pissed off about my orders and stuff like that but for the for my experiences like i look back and appreciate everything i got to do meeting oh, yeah. meeting people around the world meeting people from around the country just being in the military from all different regions you know um going places like afghanistan iraq and kuwait and you know hong kong and seeing you know all these places and just yeah. seeing different cultures and how they operate seeing how you know the craziness of you i mean you were in afghanistan and we could talk about that but the craziness of like the afghan mindset of these people that live way out in the country you know you said you were out by yeah. saying were you at a fob rob or something yeah i did uh three deployments to hellman so yeah i mean uh, all, yeah i was at fob rob for a deployment yep I tell these, I tell a lot of people, I'm like, you know, we keep hearing about on the news right now how the Taliban is a nicer t Taliban. They're going to be, they're going to be more inclusive and all this stuff. I'm like, I don't care what they're -uh. saying about what's going to happen in Kabul where all the cameras and shit are. I was like, nah. whatever's happening there, it's 10 times worse everywhere else because that's out in like Sangin or out in Marja or, you know, Harat. You know, maybe Harat's bigger, but some of these other places are like, these are country towns. They're not, yeah. it's not like the U S where everybody has internet. There's wifi everywhere. It's like paved roads. No, man. It's like way out there. And some of those Dude, people are extremists. It's like the Bible times out there. Like, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a and, weird, and it, it's not it's even a just the Taliban that are ex extreme or something. Like if you're out in a Pashtun village in you know, upper Goresh Valley somewhere, right? Like, dude, they're not letting their wife like walk to the other side of the Calais, let alone go into town by herself. Like that's just how sure. they are, you know? Yeah. I was talking, <laughs> I was, I would have conversations with the, um, Sergeant major, Sergeant major Hassan and saying, and 
Um, he was the Afghan sergeant major. He's an old Mujahideen guy who's now you know part of the A and A. He's probably honestly he's probably dead now, unfortunately, because the, the Taliban were trying to kill him when we were there in 2013. Yeah. So, oh, dude. you know, I imagine he's not doing too well now. But he was talking. We were talking. And we were watching this, like, Pakistani soap opera. You know, that's what we would do. We'd sit on these pillows and, you know, watch Pakistani soap operas and yeah. drink chai and shit. And he would talk about, like, you know, what would happen in the U.S. Like, we were watching one where a guy, like, the one I'm, I bring up specifically because it was a good conversation. There was a guy, like, beating this chick on the show because she got pregnant. Um, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, what would happen in the U.S. if that happened? And I'm like, Dude, it depends, you know, like in some way out country place in the U.S., you might get the same reaction. I was like, and in other places, like it, people don't even care. Yeah. Families don't care and stuff. It, it's just kind of all over the place. And he was talking about where he was from, where like there was a family who like tried to kill a guy because he like looked at their their sister as he walked by her, you know, yeah. and there was another guy who they tried to kill because he was like throwing rocks at the building, trying to get the sister's attention. Dude, and I'm they, like, that's a whole yeah. nother level, man. They, you know, their, their like, um, relationship with violence and stuff is different than Western culture for sure. You know, it's, yeah, don't kill a motherfucker. Like the arc, uh, Afghan commandos, uh, it was not uncommon for them to try to kill each other over rippets and shit. Like, like it's such a weird, they're yeah. the, the way they look at life is different. It's just not yeah, a, for sure. it's that very agrarian society where even the kids and stuff are kind of looked at. Yeah, they're they're part of the family, but they're also kind of workers and livestock. Like they're, they're here to help dude, run they, the farm. They they kind of ignore their kids until they're old enough to be useful around the fucking homestead. It's weird, but yeah, it's a crazy thing. Let's back talk, up though, because we didn't yeah, we didn't really yeah. talk about your uh, your sniper time in, in Iraq. So when you yeah. what kind of what kind of like targets did you find yourself engaging, and then what were like the ranges that your platoon was seeing like for your shots? So we, you know, at the time, the, what we were calling the enemy was the Fedayeen. So, mm -hmm. so almost instantly, the actual Iraqi army, you know, was was de defeated. Where where they actually, you know, the the few of them that tried to fight were immediately defeated, and then the rest kind of just took their uniforms off and dissipated. Right. Mm -hmm. So, the guys that we were fighting were we call them Fedayeen. They were, I think, they were the guys that would eventually. Be, I think they were. You know, this is this is before you know any any kind of like organized resistance to our occupation had started. So um, I don't even know like who these guys might have been. Like if they if they would eventually become like your Al Qaeda type guys or what their associations were, whether they're Bath guys or what I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, we would basically just be kind of harassed by um, these like kind of clumps of fighters that would be in plain clothes primarily. And then um, they would just be harassing, trying to delay our uh, movement towards um, Baghdad. You know, the, the the whole forces movement towards Baghdad would get harassed by these forces or whatever. So we would basically be in support of a rifle company. We'd kind of go out on patrol with them and then either do like a like leave behind type of thing where they take a long halt. And then when they roll off their long haul, we're just in that building and, we're, you know, we're in a hide site there. Um, we were shooting guys n not very long range at all. Like I'd say 300 and in for the most part. Wow. Um, cause it's urban environment. Um, yeah, I, I didn't take any shots past 250 myself. So wow. all kind of tight in stuff like, and really at that point, you know, at those ranges, like you're, it's not, uh, these are not difficult shots, you know? So the, the art in it is your position selection, your, you know, mission planning stuff. That's where you, that's where you win is that. And then these are, we're not talking about constant, um, constant engagement. So, in, you know, it wasn't uncommon for me to have to look be behind glass for two or three days, um, you know, aggressively looking for somebody to shoot before I yeah. see someone to meet criteria. And normally meeting criteria would be um, talking on a, like a communication device, like a radio or something. Very rarely was it like, I'm seeing somebody that's got a weapon and they're aiming at it. You know, these guys are not idiots, so they, you know, they're kind of careful about what they're doing, of course. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that kind of engagement, you know, that 300 and in kind of drove the push to get more like DM rifles out there that were for that mid range? It, uh, I think that drove it. And then, so Marine snipers ended up not during my time there, but uh, in Ramadi and Fallujah, 
there was some notable instances where Marine snipers were co-located with uh, Delta guys. Okay. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, it was a sniper named um, Ethan Place who was in my platoon in 2-1. He, on the next deployment, I went to work at sniper school, and he was now a school-trained sniper. He was my spotter in OAF-1. He's now a school-trained sniper, and he's out in Fallujah. Um, but he's just dumping people left and right. Him, him and the, his spotter got like 30 dudes in like a couple of days in Fallujah, right? Like un, unheard of numbers. So these Delta guys hear about this, and they want to go see what these Marine snipers are up to. Mm -hmm. Then when these exchanges started happening, and then some SEALs were around too, they had already, they were already on the uh, Mark 11 platform, had the 308 gas gun, you know, like a, basically like a stoner, like a big, you know, a, a 762 looks like an M16, if, um, if anybody's not familiar, but it would become like the Mark 11 system that we would use. But it, it, yeah, it was apparent that the guys, you know, the guys that are operating at the highest level, they're already using gas guns, you know. Um, and for an urban environment, you know, multi-shot, you know, rapid engagement, a bunch of different reasons why you'd want that platform. And um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's better than the M40 slash pistol setup you were you were yeah, actually going to roll sure. in with. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how did uh, how did that deployment end for you guys? Was it like um, were you were you there long past uh, nope. Baghdad falling, or was it you were out pretty quick? No, and we didn't even get to Baghdad. We got only as far as like Nazaria. And then really? we, we like, yeah, we held firm there. So because we were the Mew still, so we were oh, kind of yeah. separate from like the RCT five and RCT one, I think was the other, like we were kind of not part of those main efforts. We were like a supporting effort. So we only got as far as Nazaria hung out for a while. And then things really slowed down and just kind of, you know, spent a, spent a good amount of time doing not much. And then, you know, retrograde and back out of there. Being in like Nazaria, you know, which is kind of a, you know, pretty built up area around that town. What, what were the like days right after that town falling? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what was the vibe around the environment? I mean, cause there's people still living there. This is still a city where oh, people yeah. are living and how, what was like the environmentals like? We came in on the tail end of those guys from, um, second Marine division, uh, the Amtrak. So those guys got fucked up. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Ambush alley, that whole thing. We came in right on the tail end of that, and um, so we were still for for a little bit of time, a couple of weeks probably. We're still fighting in Nazaria, these like pockets of Fedayeen guys. After that, it turned into yeah, kind of like very positive response from the Iraqi people. Like you mm -hmm. know, everywhere you go, George Bush good, they give you the thumbs up and all that <laughs> kind of shit. You know, very happy to see us. And then, but by the time we were done there, we're you're starting to get this like. Hey, when is the power going to be turned back on? You blew up because we did blow up the. Um, we did a diversionary attack to for the Jessica Lynch recovery. So yeah. she was in a hospital in Nazaria. Uh, two one, I wasn't involved in it, but two one was tasked with doing this like fake diversionary attack type of thing, and they decided to attack this like power substation, which fucked up the whole power for Nazaria. And then like after a while, the people were like, "Yeah, when's the? This shit sucks. Like nothing works. Well, you know." We want it like when when Saddam Hussein was here, he was a dick, but it, but like we had power, you know. Like, yeah, for on? sure. So by the time we were leaving there, it was already starting to sour, you know, like the people. Yeah. So what was it like coming back from that first deployment? Did you did you anticipate like, man, we're gonna be going back? You know, like this is no. gonna be like a long thing. No, because George Bush stood on that aircraft carrier <laughs> and declared in his fucking in his uh, flight costume and was like, yeah, we won. And so I thought it was over. Um, I, that's why I took orders to, or I put in, I wanted to go teach at sniper school as an instructor. So I, that's what I went and did. And, um, I actually had to get hooked up to do it because I hadn't fulfilled my minimum amount of time at two one, you know, I'd only been there long enough to do a short workup in this Iraq thing. So yeah. by all rights, I should have had to be there another year and a half at least, but the, they hooked me up and they let me go. And then, um, it wasn't long before we figured out the shit was not over. And so uh, all, a bunch of dudes from my platoon went back for Fallujah. Um, and and a lot of times I'm like, man, I really should have been there, you know, for that. Because they, they had an amazing, insane deployment where they're just fucking slaying people. But um, I, you know, the, the consolation prize is I worked at sniper school. And a lot of those guys that went to Fallujah and did all that slaying, I trained those guys. So, like... I'd in my, you know, I got to participate in that way, you know, like I got yeah. to train these guys and then working at sniper school, it became apparent, like it totally changed my opinion about, uh, 
how to train and all the stuff because you know, I was when I showed up there, I was doing basically what was done to me when I was at sniper school. Just like let's make this a, um, you know, a, a tough guy school. You know, attrition is the mission. All this other shit. Well, it, there was guys coming into sniper school. So it, when guys come to sniper school, normally the snipers from my platoon will bring them to sniper school to check. You know, to kind of sit, make sure they get checked in and kind of be like dropping your kid off at school. Shit, yeah. Right? yeah. Well, and then it's an opportunity. All the snipers, you know, in the division get to, you know, sit around and rub chubs and shoot the shit or whatever. So, and then it's an opportunity for them to be like, oh, yeah, you know, this guy's good. This guy, you know, look out for this guy, whatever. But students are showing up to sniper school, and I'm talking to their senior guys, and I'm like, yeah, what's up with your your crew? You got a good bunch of guys? And they're like, yeah, those two dickheads have like four or five kills each with an M40 because they had already been in Iraq yeah, in a sniper platoon. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of just a formality. Because what's a sniper? Is a sniper somebody that use uses sniper weapons and tactics to, you know, in, affect the enemy, or is it someone who has a certificate? You know what I mean? So yeah, it's like, for sure. I we we understood that regardless of whether they left that school with a certificate or not, those guys were going back to Iraq to use those weapon systems and those tactics in combat. So it was like, all right. So there was some cases where guys would fail. They wouldn't meet the standard. And we'd be like, look, dude, you're not leaving here with a certificate. You failed stalking or whatever, but we want to keep you here to train you, you know what I mean, until until the end. This is this is now just training, right? You can come back after you get home from Iraq, try again, but we're going to keep you here and train because we know that from, from what your platoon tells us, whether you have a certificate or not, you're carrying an M40 and – Iraq. So yeah, you're still and, going down range. So, yeah. so it kind of changed my perspective a little bit about that. Were you able to take any lessons learned from your deployment and apply them to sniper school? Cause anyone that's ever worked in a formal course within the military knows that it's a fucking pain in the ass to get a course curriculum changed. Yeah. However, something like that, where you can like kind of apply different, you know, you can give information throughout the course. that's not necessarily like the official course stuff. Is that kind of what you guys did? Yep. So um, by the time I was working there, they had they had kind of formalized it a bit, and it was now at AIT Company, Advanced Infantry Training Company at School of Infantry, and so, and they were interested. The Marine Corps was very interested in adapting, you know, updating the course to to match reality. So we were pretty constantly like participating in these uh, uh, curriculum review boards and. Yeah. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And the Marine Corps was good about it. They wanted to improve the course. And, you know, and so we did. And now we complained the whole fucking time because a lot of the changes didn't come from us. They came from like some gunners somewhere. Yeah. You know, these gunners would have meetings and decide that the Marine Corps wanted no attrition. They were like, we need sn snipers are force multipliers in combat. Uh, all the after actions we're getting are saying that the snipers are doing great things. So we want more of them. And we're like, well, the reason the snipers are doing great things is because it's hard, it, it's hard to be one. And and they're like, well, we don't give a fuck. Just we want more of them. So we were always fighting with them about the attrition shit. Um, how, how do you make the course um, get as many people as possible trained without dealing without lowering the standard? It's the same problem anybody has when the, when the Marine Corps starts to meddle in their curriculum. It's like. That, you know, this is the same fight everybody has. You know, Recon has it, Marsoc has it. I'm sure yeah. Anglico. I'm sure that everybody's got like their version of that fight. You know. Yeah, no, it's same. You know, and once I Afghanistan started ramping up, and around, I want to say around 2009, 2010 time frame, that's when they were like, dude, we need more JTACs, and almost all the JTACs and listed JTACs come from the 0861 MOS. Yeah, you know that's just how it is. There's guys like you who go to the school as a secondary kind of nice to have, but yeah. the guys that are primarily doing JTAC stuff are almost always 0861s. And before that, it was like officers, and then then they were like, yeah. all right, we'll let some staff and COs in, and then they're like, all right, now we'll let in sergeants. And then around that 2009, 2010 timeframe, JTACs were so busy. They were out the door. And I mean, I knew guys like Rug and Kalo and these dudes, Musclemen, you know, and these guys were all like going on their first deployments as JTACs or going on these deployments as JTACs. And like Rug specifically, I knew was getting orders for his next deployment before he had even come back. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. from his deployment. It was like, hey, you're going to come back. You're going to get a month off. You're 30 days off. And then we need you to start yeah. your work up. And that was just kind of how it was, you know, yeah. and we've, 
I don't know. It's always been one of those kind of pains in the ass to kind of expand that community because it's like, dude, we can't just force people through here. This is one of those things. If you mess something up, you might be dropping a 2000 pound bomb on something that you weren't supposed to drop a 2000 pound bomb on, you know, like it's, and and there's not room for error. Yeah. Yeah. That happens to guys that know what they're doing that are really good. You know, it's happened. Guys have, guys have had bad drops before. It just, it's unfortunately that's, part of the game you know and we try to keep that from happening you know we try to mitigate mitigate that through screening very thoroughly people before they go to the course and then the course itself and then that follow-on training to get them designated and stuff so yeah it's it's any kind of specialized skill like that once they latch onto it and afghanistan specifically they're like no no patrol no mission no convoys go out nobody goes out without a jtac you know you're gonna need a shitload of jtacs yeah. And it's just not possible to continue to have the same quality of guys and training and stuff and cover that many spots. It's just, and that's yep. where kind of the JFO program kind of ramped up and people were like, wait, 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 we don't need this guy to be right there on the spot to say clear it hot. He can do it from yeah. almost anywhere. You know, if we have trained yep. observers out there to kind of give him some of the information, then, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things, man, you know, as the war yeah. goes on and, and you got to, like you were talking about with sniper school, you're teaching these dudes that are literally taking these skills and going next few months, going to go apply that into, a, you know, an actual war zone. And yeah. it's, I keep saying it, but it's hard for, you know, our civilian counterparts to really kind of comprehend the I, me. When I was teaching the JTAC primer course at 10th Marines, I would try to like hammer at home the seriousness of it. I'm like, look, man, this is not a fucking joke. Like the seriousness yeah. of you dropping a, a bomb on something that's not supposed to get a bomb dropped on is huge. Not only could yeah. you go to jail for it, but you're creating new enemies. It's going to be an international incident. Uh, ROEs yeah. are changing. <laughs> Everyone that comes to the appointment yeah. after you is going to be harder for them to get a control, you know, because yeah. of whatever. And um, yeah, man. So I get it. The sniper school curriculum, you know, trying to, that's, that's crazy though. Like telling guys like, sorry, you failed, but we're going to keep you here to keep training you though. But you have yeah. to, you know, get them ready as best you can before they go downrange. Yeah. Were you guys getting feedback, like live feedback from downrange? Because I know some schools oh, yeah. started doing that because they're like, hey, yeah. why don't we, why wait till these guys come back to get an AAR? We can just talk to them in the moment. We were getting guys coming back wounded, rolling mm-hmm. into sniper school, all fucked up, being like, hey, this is what's happened in time now. Because we, we weren't like in comms with the guys at the time, like when Fallujah was going on, when the push was going on, we weren't talking to them. But as guys started to get hit and come home, yeah, um, you know, we generally like, if it was a guy from a sniper platoon at 1st Marine Division and he was wounded, we'd be there at like the Naval Hospital, like when he'd finally make his way. If it, you know, some of the guys that are fucked up bad, they're in Bethesda, but if, you know, if they were just fragged up or something, They'd end up back at, uh, you know, the Naval Hospital at Pendleton and we'd be, yeah. you know, we'd see him and shit. And then we'd have him hanging around sniper school a little bit, like, you know, kind of talking about TTPs and stuff. Plus, that's better for their morale than sitting at a hospital yeah, yeah, yeah. or some kind of recovery yeah. ward. Or back with the fucking remain behind at, like, whatever <laughs> they're fucking. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. Fucking the guy, the, guy that, the guy that they leave behind to deal with the wives or whatever, it's like, what the fuck is that guy doing? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So once you were coming up towards your end of your time at sniper school as an instructor, what was on your mind? What were, what were you trying to do next? <clears throat> so at, at that time, uh, a bunch of guys that I knew were already leaving the Marines to go work for Blackwater or one of those other companies, uh, Triple Canopy, making a bunch of money. And yeah. I was like seeing the dollar signs and shit. And I'm like, and they're deploying. And, you know, some of those dudes were getting into some shit. And I'm like, man, that sounds pretty badass. And so I was coming up on my end of my enlistment, right? So I'm a, a couple of years into working at sniper school. Um, I've been back in the Marines, you know, almost four years at this point. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bounce and go, you know, do this contracting thing. But in the back of my mind, I'd always been interested in going to Force Recon. But, you know, I just, I just, for whatever reason, like I was, I really was enjoying being a sniper. Mm-hmm. And um, I was also kind of like not 100% sure I could pass the fucking end doc, you know? And, not, and like, I didn't want to try it and fail. Like, I'd never failed anything. And so it was like, I was kind of scared to fail something. Mm-hmm. So I was, in my mind, I was like, <clears throat> all right. I'm going to get out of the Marines, but before I do, I'm going to go take the Force Recon Indoc once, and if I pass it, then I'll re-enlist, and if 
and I'll go there. And if not, then I'll get out. And then at the, by this time we had recon guys, well, we had one working at sniper school as instructor. So this dude, the, the recon guy that was there, he wasn't a force recon guy, but you know, he was a recon guy and he'd mm -hmm. taken a similar, uh, in doc before a screener. And so he, for a couple months, me and him just fucking worked out. Like he, you know, he got me like ready for this thing. And, um, so I just took it and passed and, and that was it. So I reenlisted and uh, went over there to first force. Can you, so at this time was, it's changed so many times, like how the designations force recon, recon, all that yeah. at the time was force recon, like a separate platoon that had their own kind of yeah. doc and all that stuff. In yeah. addition to was, what you uh, go through past BRC. Yeah. First force recon company was at, um, at uh, Las Flores on Camp Pendleton, separate from recon battalion, N nothing really to do with each other, you know, and then in the way that the like meth conceptualized recon at the time, uh, force recon platoon was like direct action and special reconnaissance. And then the re the battalion recon was like deep recon, um, more amphib flavor. You know, it's kind of the same types of guys, but at force recon, you're more focused on direct action. So the CQB shit. And then, um, yeah, and that was under, you know, you don't really have anything to do with the meth, but it's it's like the meth's asset, but you go yeah. out on news and shit like that as platoon. So, um, yeah, so. Could you float between those? Like, can you go between you recon could, and force yeah, recon at the time? It's pretty common for guys at force recon to have been at recon battalion. Yeah. And then you may go as a force recon guy, once you pick up gunny or something, you may go back over to recon battalion to be a platoon sergeant, you know, but. You don't, it doesn't, you don't free float back and forth, but you know, generally it's a, it's a progression from recon battalion to force recon and then back there as a, as a leadership guy back to yeah. recon. Yeah. How was BRC for you and like that initial training and stuff? How did, how did you kind of like get through all that? What was your mentality? Well, so I was already, so at this, by the time I decided to go over there, I was like 30, you know, so I was a little older than most of the guys, most of the guys at BRC, they're, they're like, you know. 20 you know yeah but i also but i had the advantage of having been like i'd been in the marines for a decade i was in the sniper community so i knew the whole deal with these schools and shit i'd been to like uh jump school and ranger school so i'd like had some exposure to like some of the shit already you know and then i'd been on these mews um like i'd been on like four mew you know west packs at this point with the mew mspf and all that so i'd seen enough of like what what those guys do to kind of have a concept of it but Mm -hmm. I just made sure, um, luckily I, I stayed healthy. I didn't get injured or anything. And I made sure, you know, I just, after that in doc, I stayed fit as possible. Like all these things, they're not that hard. And as long as you want to be there and you don't quit, it's almost anybody could do it. But, but the, the more fit you are, the easier time you're going to have with like a lot of the shit, like sure. you can kind of half ass in shape and gut your way through it. But when you're in, when you're in shit, when you're on the, like the high end of the distribution for fitness in that cohort, then, you know, you're going to, you're going to kind of sail through it easier. I, um, I didn't, I didn't think BR, to be honest with you, I had to go to rip. So normally force recon will have like a training platoon where you don't, you don't go to rip the recon indoctrination program, whether they do it, uh, recon battalion, mm -hmm. they do it at force recon in house. And it's like a gentleman's thing. Like, you just work out all day. You, it's like you spend all day working out with a couple of staff sergeants or something to get you ready for BRC, but they're not dicks. They don't yell at you. They're that shit. You just work out. Well, because the war was on, you know, they didn't have spare the force recon dudes to run the training platoon. So they just sent us to like the guys that passed my indoc. They sent us all the recon battalion for rip, which is just pure hell. Like rip is for to, to like torture a bunch of PFCs to like make sure they really want to be recon guys before they send them to BRC and get these guys in shape. They're like starting from scratch for some of these guys. Right. So that was a month of just fucking not cool shit. Just, you know, just getting beat up at uh, camp Pendleton and then BRC was not that bad. It was, I, uh, like three of the guys at BRC, the instructors had been my students at sniper school. So there was a little bit of like, Oh, what's up? Look at this dude. And like get yeah. some revenge on me, but it was all kind of <laughs> like good natured, you know? Yeah. I was the class leader because I was the senior uh, student. That's not, there was a couple captains, but they don't count for anything. So I was the class leader, which, you know, makes it a little bit of a pain in the ass because I'm babysitting PFCs and stuff. But the instructors, like, you know, they'd make a show out of, like, being a dick or whatever, and then they'd pull me aside and be like, how's it going, dude? Like, you know, 
how are the students, you know, in the barracks, like, you know, any problems that it was very kind of chill in that respect. So I got through that without, without too much. So they like drama. respected your experience and stuff like that. It yeah, wasn't just I mean, a kick know, in the nuts every day. Yeah. As long as I played ball, you know, and like ran when they told me to run and all that shit, like it was all good. Like, yeah, yeah, it wasn't that bad. It was kind of fun. Like some of that shit was kind of new to me. I didn't uh, have a lot of amphib experience prior to that. I wasn't a, like, uh, I never went to like any of the like scout swimmer or any of that stuff. So a lot of that shit was kind of new to me, which was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, school after school, you're getting, you're just getting your ass kicked in these schools. It, after yeah. a while where you're like, man, what am I doing to myself? Am I some kind of sadist? It's just like getting my ass kicked. I think that if there was, if there was going to be any more after BRC, I probably wouldn't have been interested in it. Like, yeah. uh, yeah, that was that was about it for me. But that that was the like BRC was the last time I ever really had to go to one of those kind of schools where they're like dicks, you know. But even yeah. I, I was still like in this mode where like I and I kind of I kind of miss it now, you know, where I liked the challenge, you know, I like the sure. schools kind of because it's it's like I I like um I like to like have to demonstrate, you know, my competence or it's like an ego thing maybe or something. I, well, and, yeah. I, and it's a school is a good place because everything's, te- you know, there's a lot of metrics. And so you really get to see where you shake out with other people, you, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's like and I was getting a kick out of the fact that I was 30 and, you know, I could I could I could still hang with some of these kids that are like 20, 21 years old. The thing is, though, with Recon and Marsoc, there's a lot of mutants, you know, these guys that are like athletes, you know what I mean? And I'm not one of those guys like my rest my normal you know um baseline (laughs) fitness level is not high like it i it requires a lot of work on my part to be fit i'm not like my body type and shit i'm a chubby little fucker so like to maintain that level of fitness took a lot of work um but what it's kind of one of those things like you probably experienced this too right once you have that momentum and you're fit it's not that hard to stay that way but it's like if I were to try to get back into that shape now, I would just die probably. So it's you have to almost be in an environment like that where yeah. where not only are you you being challenged by the work that you're doing, you know, day in and day out. You know, you're doing. It's 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 when you look back. When I look back on stuff, it's like, dude, I was basically an athlete for a little while. Like yeah. you know, coming in, I'm getting paid yeah. to come in and work out for a couple hours. And then, like, when we're not working out, it's like, hey, start moving all this gear. and Let's do this shit. Yeah. It's constant just, you know, yep. getting out there and doing stuff. It'd be hard to, like, get on. You know, and it's what's funny is guys come back from deployment, like, super jacked. And everyone's like, I'm going to try to maintain this when I get back. No, you're, yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. bro, you cannot maintain that. That's from starvation yeah. and from, yeah. like, being in 110 degrees and sweating constantly and foot patrols. And the reality yeah, is... is when you get yeah. back, you're like, hey, I'm going to go grab a beer with my buddy. And we're going to watch this yep. UFC fight or something like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you you in Afghanistan and shit, you're basically, when you're wearing gear, you're just kind of walking around in a sauna. You know, you, you've yeah. got a, like a self-contained sauna on your chest. Like, yeah, you're going to get ripped, dude. Like, you're yeah. moving around with a hot little cage on your torso. For sure. And you're wearing kit. You, I mean, it, after a while, it becomes just second nature. You just throw it on. It's like, whatever. Yeah. But in reality, you're carrying 30 plus pounds on your upper body constantly. Yep. You know, it's just a constant workout. Um, yeah, it's cool. You know, you, you obviously strive to to like be around like that next level of people. You know, like this is cool, but those guys look cooler. Or they're doing cool stuff. I want to be part yeah. of that because that looks like a special whatever. Yeah. Kind of, you know, we can, let's talk to this a little bit and then we'll end it here and we'll come back and talk more about your, uh, the rest of your career and stuff, but kind of, can you kind of explain the drive that comes out of people that are in these like small teams, like at Marsoc or recon or like a sniper school? Because I've talked about it before on the podcast and it's like, when you're in these small teams, you, everybody has a specific role. And, and you don't want to fail. Like you don't want to be the guy that lets the team down. So everybody's like striving to be even better. So now among all these like super alpha, like awesome, badass dudes within that people are ranking themselves out, you know, to be even more badass because they don't want to be, you know, like the guy holding the team back. So can you kind of explain that kind of experience and, you know, your over a decade in that kind of lifestyle? Yeah, I think, you know, I think um, people come to it for different reasons. And I think, like I said, now there's so much 
access to information about the stuff that like it's not uncommon you know and i'm still around these guys because i you know i've worked there as a contractor so i'll meet guys that are young and and they'll they knew before they joined the marines there's you know marsoc has been around long enough now that there's guys who knew the entire time before they even went to boot camp that they wanted to be a special operations guy so they were choosing between green berets air force pararescue seals and marsoc or whatever right and they made their choice in that way that's mm-hmm. totally different than most of the guys I came up with. And it and I think, it, like, for me, it was very, it was gradual. You know, it was like I would get a glimpse of, of that next kind of, like, ridge line or whatever, but it all seemed attainable. You know, it was like guys that I knew, right? Like, I'd meet these guys, you know, uh, like Force Recon guys in the MU or something. And, you know, I, it would seem possible. I'd be like, well, fuck, you know, those guys are doing this, you know. Actually, the first time I saw Force Recon guys, I thought they were – some other shit entirely like it was when i was a boot back when they were still wearing like black like swat gear and shit mm. this specific re- force recon platoon must have all been on like all the steroids because they all looked like <sighs> action figures so i i didn't think it was possible at that time but then later on but i think that um you know i think it's a momentum thing you you get in this mode where if you're if you're not progressing it feels like you're you're failing in some way you know it's like you don't you you don't accept the status quo you know Mm -hmm. but um i did at a certain point so you get to marsoc and there's there's basically another ridge line right so there's guys that that they start looking out of the out of the marine corps into the, the special mission units right so we've got guys that go you know to delta or um titan zeus another you know another unit so these guys start looking at that at that point when i was at the position where i'm now at marsoc i'm comfortable i've been around a while i i knew enough of what goes on over there and what that screener is about and what that lifestyle is about to be in those units that that's where i i made the you know i didn't even entertain it you know i was like Mm -hmm. nope i'm good right here there's enough and then you know i found that there was enough where i was at to keep me um busy you know what i mean so for a while you know i was a uh, became a, a dari linguist right so it's like i this is a place where i can focus my energy you know and and try to like you know pick up a new skill here where i'm at you know yeah. and then kind of like the jtac thing too like that's another you know there's enough opportunities right there to go in different directions within the community to keep someone like me satisfied but I definitely know guys that they can't help but look. There's guys that are at Delta Force looking, trying to see if there's some other shit they can get into. You know, like, okay, this is pretty cool, but what's am I the, the next coolest? level? Yeah. Am I the coolest there's ever been? Like, what can I, you know, I, I was, I was pretty satisfied once, once I was at Mars. Like, especially like the Afghanistan thing was going on while I was there. So that's all the um, challenge I needed. Like, you know you get in this rotation where it's, you know, deployment to Afghanistan, one year back, work up, deployment, right? So once you're in that cycle, that whole thing took over my whole basically existence. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it in my life, it was Afghanistan like 24 hours a day kind of, you know? And so yeah. I had plenty to keep me busy because, dude, you you know how it is over there. Like that's anybody that needs more challenge than rolling around the helmet. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, well, that's a vicious cycle for you too. You say one year back, but that's not like one year back of relaxing. That's like no, you're work, schools you're, and fucking yeah. workups and everything yeah. else. But for me, I was um, single the whole time I was in Marsoc. I got married again, um, but right when I went over to Force Recon, my second wife fucking took a hike. So <laughs> I had no family other than you know my parents and brother and sister and stuff. But yeah. I didn't have any obligations and responsibilities to anything other than myself and my career so that made it very easy for me you know hey brand fast we need you to go to this fucking school for a month like dope where's it at am i get a tad do i get a rental car it's gonna be awesome like let's go you know like Mm -hmm. didn't care yeah yeah man yeah that's that's completely different for sure i was thinking about this the other day um how you know experiences may vary you know i was married when i came in and i was my wife moved down um, like a like a couple months into my fleet time, so I didn't I didn't live in the bar. I didn't do four years in the barracks like a lot of guys did. You yeah. know, experience that kind of Marine Corps. I was wife, kid, living in base housing, and so that just that 
you know, having that difference is that's way different than yeah. living in the yeah. barracks and dealing with yeah, it's a different lifestyle. Yeah. All of it's different, you know? So every step is like, I don't know, experiences may vary. And it's one of those things like the Marine Corps as a whole, you gotta, you gotta make the best of your own situation. And like, you know, the whole grow where you're planted kind of thing is kind of yeah. true. Like, Hey man, you might get some shitty orders. It happens try to make the best of it and get some schools out of it or, or meet some new people that can help you out down the line or you can help them out yep. down the line or, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just a big game, man. I, I miss so, the things I miss about the Marine Corps myself are just going out to the OP and, you know, hanging out with my oh, homies yeah. and stuff and n- none of the other bullshit though, you know, none of the So you, craziness. you had kids, uh, you had kids when you were on combat deployments? Yeah. Yeah. So my kid, my yeah. son was born while I was in MOS school, actually. I, I, I had a kid, my son, late in life. I was already 30, 30 40, 39 when my son was born. Mm-hmm. And and having a kid now com- changes my perspective. Like, I have a lot of respect looking back um, for the guys that I was around that had families. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't, like, it wasn't, imp- I didn't, I didn't care. Like, I, when guys had to miss shit for family reasons, I would, ju- I was judgy about it. I was like, oh. Must be nice. When you're in a. Yeah, when you're in a SOCOM unit, they, the, uh, the regular Marine Corps doesn't do this shit. But, like, if you're in SOCOM and you're having a kid, they'll send you home from the middle of a combat deployment so you can be there for when your kid's born. Or they'll really? let you show up late, go home early, that kind of shit. And so that would happen in my teams. And a guy that was a good friend of mine, he didn't deploy when we deployed because he was home to have his kid. So he showed up almost a month late. And, like, the first word out of my mouth when I see him is, like, yeah, glad you could finally fucking join us, dude. Like. <laughs> You know, like a dick. Now, yeah, yeah. in hindsight, I'm like, no, 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 no. Your f- son, your family is way more important. D- dude, it is as irreplaceable as any of us think we are. You're you're not. Like, they'll, the Marine Corps, the war, whatever it is, mm-hmm. will, will continue on absent you. But, you know, I just, looking back, I was like, man. That. And I knew some guys that were really good dads, you know what I mean? That were like, when they weren't fighting – blowing people's heads off in Afghanistan. They were like very focused on their family, very good guys. And that must, I know how hard that is, you know, to like, yeah, it's tough dude. And I will say that for me, it was kind of easier at first, I guess. Cause my son was so, so small, you know, yeah, the cause baby, when they're yeah. a baby, it's like, you yeah, miss them. They don't need you that much. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the first time I was getting ready to go to some school, I don't know if it was after I lap moved or something, but I went to some school and I remember my kid, we, they were dropping me off at the airport. And my kid is like, don't leave, dad. Come oh, home yeah. and watch, come home and watch uh, whatever Pixar movie was out at the time. Yeah. Come home and watch this movie with me. And he was just crying. I'm like, dude, like, uh, oh, yeah. now yeah. he actually knows I'm leaving and he's showing emotions. And that's tough. Yeah. And honestly, that my son is probably is one of the top reasons I got out because I did back-to-back mute deployments. I went with Anglico, and then I came back, and then I went as the Anglico detachment for the 11th mute. Then we came back, and then they're like, hey, you're going back to the 11th mute, but we need a fires chief, so you're not going with Anglico this time. You're going to the mute as mute proper. And I'm like, Ugh. what? And yeah. I knew w- what my job was going to be. It was going to be fucking answering phones in the LFOC, and st- like standing mm. watch. That was it. There was nothing, yeah. you know? And I'm like, dude, I can't justify leaving my kid for seven months to, to go sit on a fucking ship and answer the phone, just to turn around and hand it to someone else. You know, like I'm literally here to stand watch. That's it. And that was a huge, that was a huge part of my decision to get out. I was like, dude, this just, I just can't justify it anymore. When you're talking about going to Iraq or Afghanistan, especially with my, you know, my guys that I'm training with and, you know, that's different because I feel like we're doing something like it's purposeful kind of work. But going and sitting on a ship and just waiting for something that might come down the line, I was like, fuck yeah. this. It's not working yeah. for me. So that's when I pulled the trigger and, you know, I moved along. But, yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, I'm divorced now, too. I got divorced on my way yeah. out. On my way it out happens. of the Marine Corps. It, you know, five deployments. And, like, I did all I, – I missed – my first three years I didn't deploy. Well, my first two and a half. My first deployment was in 2009. And 09 to 2016, I knocked out five deployments. So it was like, Jesus. it was just super fucking like one, you know, and then field ops uh, and then, tra- you know, like all that stuff. Yeah. So I was like super busy. And um, I don't know, man, it's tough with the family for sure. It's oh, definitely yeah. tough. And, but I'm just like you though, I would see people that would use families to get out of shit though. 
not oh, nec- yeah, yeah. not necessarily like, hey, I get it. You're going to watch your kid be born. That's completely different. Yeah. But, but like other shit, guys will use sometimes like a doctor's appointment or whatever. It's like, dude, come on, man. You're you're making Brown, yourself yeah, look bad. Brown bagger shit. That's what we call it. For sure. All <laughs> right, man. Well, I want to get into yeah. like your, um, you know, some of the schools and stuff you did with recon and, and your Marsoc time and stuff. But I think we should we should save that for another episode if you're down yeah, for cool. that. Um, yeah, for sure. What social media do you have you want to put out there? Or- uh, so just check uh, – if guys want, they can check out the podcast I do with a, another Marine uh, Raider EOD tech. It's called Stranger by the Hour podcast. It's not necessarily like a military-focused thing. We get into some stuff, but it's it's mostly focused on, uh, you know, like geopolitics. We're kind of into uh, alternate theories, that type of thing. Mm. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about um, – what what people should be doing right now if they're not um, super stoked about all these changes that are going on in uh, um, society and all culture and not from a like rise up and fight the government perspective but from a uh, reducing your dependency on these systems so that as these systems change and you don't like the new rules you're not required to um, participate so we're talking about stuff like uh, you know we just bought a 50 acre uh, compound basically out in uh, North Carolina and we're interested in reducing dependency. So, you know, growing your own food, producing your own energy, uh, becoming entrepreneurs so you don't have to work at a job that's going to require you to do things you don't want to do vis-a-vis your health. That type of stuff is what Mm -hmm. we kind of talk about. And then when we're not talking about that, we talk about like wild, like, um, you know, fucking what, what the fuck are the pyramids, you know, like free energy <laughs> shit, like oh, that kind of like weird, like kind of bugged out shit. Not a lot of military shit, but every once in a while, you know, we get into that. So, Hey, nothing wrong with that, man. I mean, I think a lot of people over the last two years of COVID have realized like, Hey man, I need to like prepare myself to sustain myself yeah. because how many people were like, I don't know. People lost jobs. People weren't able to go to the store. People weren't able to, you know, get the things and necessities and stuff. That's you right. saw the fucking maniacs clear the shelves out. Oh, I can't buy toilet paper for two months because yeah, Karen yeah. wants to buy two carts, you know, two cartloads full of them. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. That's the way it should be. That's good stuff, man. I think people. Uh, where can they check that out at? Uh, YouTube, uh, anywhere there's podcasts. So, like I said, Stranger by the Hour podcast. It's a YouTube channel, so we we do it on there. It's on. We try to get everybody to watch it on Rockfin. We just think Rockfin's a better uh, platform right now. You know, like we, uh, the algorithm, you know, smashes our show because of the shit we talk about. Um, mm-hmm. But we don't. You know, YouTube doesn't belong to me. You know what I mean? I don't get to set the rules about it. Um, so, but the more that we kind of use these alternate platforms, the more viable they'll become. For sure. So, yeah, Rockfin, check us out huh? there. Rockfin's good. Like, you have to pay a membership. I think it's like five bucks a month. Hmm. But um, it's free, open, uncensored, and it's, it actually works pretty good. Like, it's, you know, like, YouTube and Instagram are fucking good for a reason. Like, the shit works really well. You know, like, it's the the interface and stuff is better. Yeah. Like some of these alternate platforms, like, parlor and locals and shit the interface is clunky and shitty and so you compare it to like youtube and instagram and you're like nah th- this one sucks so but yeah rockfin's pretty good yeah it's hard to compete when you don't have a billion dollar company like facebook you know yeah, funding yeah, yeah. your adventure like instagram and stuff yeah. so that's cool man i'll make sure to put that uh make sure to put your guys's uh instagram handle and stuff up on the page for everybody cool. out there, check my stuff out. jkramergraphics.com is my website. Check me out on Instagram, at former action guys, at jkramergraphics, both of those. And uh, I think that's it. I think so. Uh, yeah, thanks man. for coming on, man. Yeah, this is fun, man. It's great talking to you. Yeah, for sure. Hey, can you do-